Good evening and welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting of March 6, 2014. I'm City Council President Bill Dwight and I'm presiding. Uh, we begin every meeting before we actually convene uh, with public comment um, and we ask as you speak to come up and identify yourself and give your address and also keep your remarks within three minutes. There'll be a timer that runs up here. Um, also just just for those of you playing along at home, the, the principal discussions tonight uh, will be centered around the stormwater management and flood control enterprise fund and also a number of financial orders uh, in second reading and some first reading on some uh, property dispositions too and finance. So that's your agenda for tonight. So you can up and play along at home. Uh, first up, we're going to call folks in the order that they were signed up. Is uh, George Bernier? Hi, I'm George Bernier. Uh, number one, I have a hard time talking, so you have to slow down, all right? Please. Sure. Talk. Uh, can you can you tell us your address, please, George? It's uh, uh, North, North King Motel. Okay. okay good enough. Thank you. Huh? That's good. Oh, thank okay, you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if it's supposed to be right or not. Uh, I'm here to complain about the park. You, the ice that's on the park, right? Pulaski Park, where the buses come. You fall constantly. Somebody's always falling. There's got to be two feet of ice there, and nobody's doing a thing. So that's number one. You know, number two, I, I want to complain about the deaths in this city of a heroin. Yeah. It's a shame that all these young kids are dying for nothing. Yeah. For nothing at all. They, 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 they're getting their heroin out of Holyoke. They're coming by bus. The bus drivers can't do a thing about it. You know, they, 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 I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> they're uh, having one hell of a time you know, controlling their buses. They do heroin right on the bus. They take the needles, throw them out the window. They take the beer cans, throw them out the window. Now, now they're into taking their clothes off and dancing around the bus. Nice, huh? And the bus drivers, they want the job. They, they, they can't say nothing to the people, you know? And uh, they, they, had a, they had a person last night die, die again, well, frozen to death. Yeah. And this is, this is the second one frozen this year. Booze yeah. and heroin do not mix. <coughs> and they're getting, their boo, they're getting their heroin out of Holyoke. And everyone knows this. And it's going to Walter Sable. Why isn't the person who's in charge of the housing do something about this? You know? Stop these people from coming in. They know who they are. I, 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 I named you two apartments up there that are main. One's 406, and the other one's uh, 604. And that's where the people are getting their drugs out of. I told the cops this. They, they've been down there a hundred times. They get nothing. Nothing at all. You know? And I, I feel sorry for the parents and for the people that have to bury their kids. You know? Because somebody's making money. And that's all it is. And where's, where's Mr. Height? He's nowhere to be seen. Where's the big cop officer down there? The city police have has cops come down there constantly. The ambulance is down there constantly. You know? Where are these people? When they when big stuff, I, I complained. They told me, wait, 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 wait. I'm tired of waiting. That's the, the year and a half now. Let's do something about that drug dealing at Walter Savile, right? And uh, Walter Savile's doing the whole North Hampton right now. You want drugs? Go down to Walter Savile. Go to go to apartment 406. Guaranteed, you'll get what you want, right? But the, 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 I went there in uh, Holyoke. The bus they had, right? The, the, that big building. How many? From North Hampton, we're there. How, how many? No, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, your time's up, but thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Emory Ford, please. <clears throat> I'm Emory Ford, <coughs> 364 Spring Street, Florence. I'm here to talk about the stormwater and uh, flood control fee. As the proposed ordinance stands, it calls for cha charging the city a fee for stormwater and flood control. In my opinion, that is not a good idea because it transfers more of the burden to the residents. The so-called rationale is that everyone should receive a bill. However, the city pays its bills by taxing citizens. Therefore, the proposed stormwater control fee to the city will be transferred to the citizens in the real estate tax. If the city does not pay a fee for the floodwater control fees, 
will be distributed amongst the entities shown in the pie chart. Each of you counselors have a copy of this I sent you each, so we won't discuss this. At least one member of the Chamber of Commerce has suggested to me that assessing the city a stormwater control fee would promote fiscal responsibility. In my opinion, this reasoning is not correct. If the city is charged the fee, it will have to raise the money through taxes. The city will have to pay the fee, and therefore the money will be raised through taxes. Residents pay 80% of the taxes in this town and will pay 80% of the fee <coughs> that the city would have to pay. <coughs> in addition, the risk to businesses from a flood caused by excessive stormwater from the Connecticut River uh, <coughs> is greater than for a single residence. It therefore seems to me that businesses should bear a significant burden for flood control and stormwater control. One might think of it in this way. The cost of collision insurance is directly related to the value of the car protected by the insurance. A stormwater control fee is, in a sense, an attempt to provide some insurance against the flood. <clears throat> Two slides uh, were attached to an email that I sent to all the council members. Here are the slides. <clears throat> The pie chart that I showed you earlier shows the distribution of tax <coughs> receipts between residences and businesses. The pie chart also shows the distribution of stormwater control fees in the proposed ordinance. As proposed, the city would pay 9% of the total fees, which would be directly passed on to the residents through taxes, making the fees 60% as opposed to the 51% in the pie chart. That is so because the city would have to pay its share through taxing the citizens with real estate taxes. I urge you to seek an amendment to the proposed ordinance eliminating the proposed fee to the city. Thank you very much. And, uh, and I would like to submit a copy of what I've said here for the record. Thank you, Emory. Concise and on time. Amazing and appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Susan Timberlake, please. Susan Timberlake, uh, Florence, Mass. And um, I'm on the parking committee. I'm actually here not to complain or say anything like that. But uh, <laughs> Councillor Klein actually encouraged me to come over. Our um, chair of our committee was actually couldn't come tonight. But we have two openings on our committee, and we're really hoping for business business membership. We have a lot of citizens, but we need um, downtown business, um, maybe from the restaurant and entertainment business, and maybe a small retailer. And um, the reason I'm doing it here is because it's on the air, and I believe you submit your application to the Transportation and Parking Commission, and we're hoping to get a lot of business owners because we have a lot of things to talk about, and we really need your input. So thank you. Thank you very much. Jasper Lapienski, please. My name is Jasper Lapienski. I live at 226 South Street. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, the stormwater ordinance, which creates the stormwater utility, represents nothing more or less than a gargantuan discretionary budget worth tens of millions of dollars. Did I forget my yellow flag, you ask? No, I did not. I'm in favor of the city of Northampton having drainage, and I agree that this is the best way to go about ensuring that. I will, however, defend my assertion that the utilities budget will have discretionary tendencies under the following premise. While the money can only go towards the purpose of ensuring that we have drainage, the Department of Public Works will have discretion in how they go about providing that service with this money. To be precise, they will have as much or as little discretion as the council and the mayor will allow, and the record suggests that both tend to work on the side of much. The comedian Lewis Black once said that a public works project is a process in which, quote, you pay a lot of people to build something, and that stimulates the economy. Obscenities redacted. The discretion involves what you build and how you build it. The stormwater ordinance money will be spent on two things, stormwater management and, in conjunction with other accounts, on items that are affected by the construction of stormwater management systems and which would therefore be inefficient to fix separately, namely roads, bridges, and sidewalks. 
If we are indeed about to open up a big pot of money and fix a lot of stuff and fix it good so as not to have to fix it again soon, then it follows that as we fix things, we should design them for the next 25 years rather than the last. And it's a sad fact that the Department of Public Works of the City of Northampton has no vision for the next 25 years. And what's more, given the reappointment of the old guard to the Board of Public Works, apparently neither does the rest of the city government. Our roads are falling apart and our sidewalks were either never built or abandoned in the 1980s and never reclaimed. First, the roads. Statistically speaking, the most likely cause of any given pothole is another pothole. The chicken or the egg? Nay, the stormwater management system. The first things to go on any new road are always the drains and the drain gas and electric entrance holes. Once they have sunk their customary two inches, each successive tire hits at 30 miles an hour and 80 pounds per square inch and so fractures the pavement incrementally with the impact. <coughs> Six months of that and a handful of plow trucks. How did it happen so fast? North Street, you're up next. <coughs> so if we're going to sink good money into new drains and new roads, is it really that much to ask that we think it through first? The logic will actually work for you if you give it a minute. Because if you take the stormwater entrance holes out of the travel lanes, where, it, where does it go? The sidewalks which is the best excuse I can think of to build us some sidewalks other than my usual because we need them, which so far hasn't worked. Narrower roadways not only calm traffic, they also reduce the demand for stormwater drainage. It is uncanny how my standard agenda of demotorizing the city fits so neatly into the best practices that could be implemented into the retrofitting of our stormwater infrastructure. But they won't be because the DPW is addressing the next 25 years if, as if they were the last 25 years. They have no forward vision and they operate an accountability vacuum that stands in contrast to the relative responsiveness of most of our city government in comparison to other Massachusetts municipalities. With sufficient directive and proper oversight, last sentence, with the sufficient directive and proper oversight, we will look back 10 years from now and wonder why this was ever controversial. The time for the directive is now and I urge you to amend the ordinance to include it. <coughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> Suzanne Beck, please. So hi, I'm Suzanne Beck. I live at 691 Park Hill Road, and I'm here tonight representing the Greater Northampton Chamber of Commerce and our support for the Stormwater Utility Ordinance. I'd like to start really by thanking the City Council and the Board of Public Works <coughs> and the Department of Public Works. This process has included many different constituencies over a long period of time. I think you've done a great job taking a lot of different viewpoints and incorporating them into the ordinance that's proposed tonight. There were um, a number, there are a number of aspects of the ordinance that we're um, strongly supporting. The first of all is the need for the investment. We've concluded really as along with you that the scale of the, or the overwhelming condition of the, um, the evidence of the condition of the stormwater infrastructure is overwhelming in, in terms of the need for the investment. And it's certainly a scale of investment that could never be um, accommodated through general tax revenues. There was a lot of discussion and um, planning about the amount of public outreach, and we feel that you guys have done an excellent job um, in reaching each neighborhood, each ward, um, and working with the chamber to reach commercial property owners and taxes against properties. We believe the fee methodology is equitable. We also believe it's important that the city participates in the funding of the utility. The ordinance has uh, really good checks and balances, giving the council the authority to approve the budget and the DPW um, the re responsibility for implementing and managing the system. We strongly supported the proposed uh, $2 million cap on expenses for the first five years that uh, Councillor Adam proposed. I understand that there's a, a legal um, issue regarding that. We're hoping that somehow that restriction can be accommodated um, in another way through the Board of Public Works that we have you. There has been um, a lot of discussion and not always agreement on how indirect costs should be treated with the stormwater utility. Uh, we do support the mayor's proposal that that be considered, evaluated, um, and, and better understood through the budget process for fiscal 15. So we'll work with you um, as that process move fo moves forward. In closing, I'd like to thank the Board of Public Works again, the Department of Public Works, the Chamber's own Stormwater Subcommittee, and again, members of the City Council. I do really do believe that the significance of this decision, which is a very large one, and the effort that has been put in by you and others, which has also been significant, 
were very well matched, and I appreciate uh, the time and attention and thoroughness of the process um, that you undertook. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Rick Clark, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Rick Clark. I live at 84 Williams Street, and uh, I sat on the on the stormwater task force, which was um, a real honor to to work with with citizens, you know, across the city. Um, it was my first foray into this into this uh, type of, of work, and I, I really enjoyed it. it. It was a long process. We met for months, as you know, um, and. Uh, I believe that we're all in agreement that we need this utility and it's it's frankly it, I'm in the business I inspect pipes for a living and I know this issue in this city has been discussed and talked around for at least 20 years so um, I'm, I'm glad to see us moving you know in this direction but I feel that it, for some reason it got rushed even though we've known this for a long time um, so I think the process I know we need to raise the money. Um, I think the process is not um, near where it could be as far as education uh, of the public, uh, for instance. I don't see a lot of people here tonight. I'm disappointed uh, by that. So the uh, task force recommended to you two formulas, and uh, we could have recommended three. We actually were close to recommending three. We, we decided to recommend only two because one of our members said, uh, you know, the third one always gets kicked out anyways. But we wanted to give you choices. And for some reason, um, it was never discussed between the council members, uh, the choices that you were provided. It was just uh, assigned to the BPW, and uh, that was it. You, you didn't have uh, any discussion about, and I believe, uh, political discussion uh, about the different types of, of ways of doing this. Um, so you pick the hydraulic acreage formula, which is a great formula. Uh, it's used mostly in the west on great big tracts of land to collect all sorts of surface measurements. And for, uh, for precision, it's a great formula. Uh, the other formula was a very simple formula, the opposite. So I'm wondering and I'm confused as to why the complexity and the precision of of this formula has been removed basically you've limited the the measurement of the surface you know of open space to just one acre um, which I as a task force member I don't remember that being uh, how, how we looked at it in town we talked about having everyone pay so we wanted to include the open tracts of land the undeveloped parcels and that's that's why we even talked about pervious surface at all um, so I, I would ask you to look at the, the complexity that you've given up. Uh, there's different surface measurements, coefficients that can be used. Um, and the, the rush, I think, has also you know, sacrificed this. I, I'd agree with Emery uh, Ford about what he said about the city paying. Uh, my, my recollection was this was discussed a great deal in, in the task force, and there's just been no discussion about it here. And, uh, I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's all we have signed up. Is there anyone interested in speaking? No? Okay. We will, um, I will ask the secretary to call attendance. Here. Present. Here. Present. Here. 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 We have a quorum, in fact, here. So I uh, call this meeting to order. The um, we're right now, let's see. We have a presentation. Do we have a presentation scheduled, Mary? No. Um, <coughs> do you want to announce a public hearing? <coughs> okay. We'll just go straight to the mayor. Communications from the mayor. The mayor has a proclamation for us, and also. Um, an update on our revised bond rating. Good evening, uh, members of the City Council. Yes, I do have a, um, a proclamation that I wish to issue this evening. Um, it's entitled Brain Injury Awareness Month, uh, March 2014. 
um, and uh, I'll, I'll read it to you now. Whereas 2.4 million Americans sustain a traumatic brain injury each year, contributing to one third of all injury related deaths in the United States, and whereas these injuries are largely re the result of motor vehicle crashes, falls, assaults, biking, and other sports related injuries and occupational injuries, and whereas something as seemingly innocuous as riding your bike one time without a helmet could result in an injury that happens in an instant, bringing a lifetime of physical, cognitive, and behavioral challenges, and whereas properly fitted helmets reduce the risk of brain injuries by 88%, if every cyclist wore a helmet, it would prevent an estimated 150 deaths and another 100,000 non-fatal head injuries each year. And whereas early, equal, and adequate access to care will greatly increase overall quality of life and will enable individuals to return to home, school, work, and community, now therefore I, Mayor David J. Narkowitz, do hereby proclaim the month of March 2014 to be Brain Injury Awareness Month in Northampton. Let us support organizations and programs that assist residents with traumatic brain injury along with <coughs> their families, but also educate our community about the extent, causes, consequences, treatment, and prevention of traumatic brain injury. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and imprinted the city seal this sixth day of March in the year 2014. And Mr. President, I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, Mary Collier, who's a resident of Florence, um, who brought this issue to my attention. She is an ambassador uh, for the Brain Injury uh, Association here in Massachusetts. And I'd like to call her up to the podium to accept this uh, proclamation and have her say a few words, if sure. I may. Mary? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning. Good evening, City Council members. My name is Mary Noel Collier, and I live at Tobin Manor in Florence, Massachusetts. I've been brain injured since June 24th, 1979. I got my bicycle at my injury by riding a bike back then without a helmet. I fell off my bike and hit my head on regular cement that you find outside your doors. I was unconscious for three minutes and woke up. I had to have my whole head operated on, including my brainstem. I had a blood clot that large on my brainstem. I was only seven years old and in the fourth grade. I've been, since then, since that day, I've been having, I had speech therapy, occupational therapy and every type of therapy to help me get to where I am today. I had to learn how to walk, how to talk, how to feed myself all over again. I was doing gymnastics, ballet, and doing things that a normal seven-year-old would wanna do. But because of this, my life was changed and the effects on my family were changed. My parents have been my biggest supporters, but I go around this town where I've moved and I see students from the high schools, elementary and adults all over not wearing bicycle helmets. I don't wish my brain injury on anyone. A brain injury happens every 18.5 seconds. The estimated costs for a brain injury in a year is $60 billion. Falls result in the greatest number of emergency department visits and hospitalizations. More than 85% of TBIs are all preventable. Properly fitted helmets reduce the risk of brain injuries by, an eight, by 88%. And if every bicyclist wore a helmet, it would prevent an estimated 150 to in another thousand non-fatal head injuries a year. National statistics, 1.7 million people sustain a traumatic brain injury in the United States each year. 52,000 die, 275 are hospitalized as a result of brain injuries. A TBI can result from a bump or blow to the head or the body that causes the brain to move rapidly inside your skull. It can happen during a car crash, sports, fall, bomb blasts, etc. Non-traumatic brain injuries may be, uh, may be 
caused by stroke, anorexia, brain tumors, infection, and con con um, abnormalities. Members of the committee, I'm trying to help the students because I don't wish, wish this on anybody or anyone's family. Please help me with the schools and help the kids understand that I don't want their families to go through what mine has. I've been brain injured for 30 something years. It's not an easy thing and it's constantly day after day of recovery. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. So, Your Honor, the, you have an announcement relative to our bond rating. That's correct. I, I, um, I th believe we included in the packet, um, uh, we received word, I think I spoke to you several months ago about our bond rating uh, with uh, Moody's Investor Services. We are also rated by state Standard & Poor Rating Services. And so I included in, the, um, in your council packet, we received word uh, from Standard & Poor's uh, last Friday that, in fact, our bond rating had been upgraded. Uh, we were at an A-plus level, uh, and they have reviewed our financial statements. I think you can read the report. Um, uh, gave us a very strong review of not only of our strong local economy, uh, but of our, our fiscal position, our debt position, our management practices. And so they've upgraded us to uh, AA plus, double A plus, uh, which is in fact their second highest rating. Uh, so we're very pleased about that. Um, I obviously want to thank um, Susan Wright, our finance director, and her team for all the work that they uh, do to help us uh, uh, to help us be in a position to receive this upgrade. And obviously thank the city council for working uh, with uh, my administration uh, to put in place the, the policies and, and our commitment to stabilization funds and et cetera uh, to be able to receive this rating. It's obviously going to help us when we go out to bond in the future. Um, and so I just wanted to report that good news to the council. Thank you. Uh, Do you have any questions? To that. Thank you. And I just would say the report is posted online on the city's website. So if uh, members of the public want to read it as well, it is available along with all of our other uh, bond ratings. Thank you. Um, the one minute announcements. Uh, um, I'm going to remind people of a public hearing on the petition of the Northampton Business Improvement District, which is scheduled for 7.05 p.m. <clears throat> Thursday, March 20th. Um, so, uh, and that, and it's relative to the fee structure. So, so if people want to come and participate in that. Just remember that it's on that point. It's no other issues associated with it, and that's. I'd like to keep the hearing limited to that discussion, please. Uh, also, the city council is going to march in the St. Patrick's Day parade, and that's on Sunday, March 23rd um, of this year. 12 p.m. They step off at 12. Uh, we're going to have the details on this soon because we're not sure where we rank in the parade. Alphabetically, we're on the low end of the parade. We could die of exposure in the parking lot waiting for the parade to step off. So we're going to hopefully have a determination for that. I think I've heard back from most counselors who are interested uh, uh, in attending. Also, um, there is the breakfast, of course which I believe Council Murphy will probably explain. Um, there's also another public hearing, and that's the Capital Improvement Program, which uh, you're in receipt of the mayor has presented as Capital Improvement Program, and that we will have a hearing scheduled for that at 7.05 uh, Thursday in these chambers, April the 3rd, 2014. And this is for, this is for the proposed uh, uh, CIP for FY 2015, to FY 2019, it's a five-year plan. Uh, and then also, uh, Mary, as you know, um, is leaving, and so we actually um, have an opportunity. We, we changed the, uh, the, the one of the June meetings to June 26th, the second meeting to June 26th to accommodate Mary in the vacation plans. Well, now she's going on a permanent vacation, <coughs> basking in the warm sun of the police department and so she wanted to know if it's the counselor's preference to retain that meeting scheduled date or 
revert it back to June uh, 19th. Or does anyone have any opinion about that? Can you just remind us what the date change was? The date was from June 19th, and we changed it to June 26th. So I don't know if anyone's, I mean, I, just let me know if you have an objection as we go, and, we'll, and then we'll bring it up and decide whether that it's appropriate to change it right now. We'll keep with June 26th unless I hear otherwise. So that's the end of my one minute announcements. Any other announcements from any other councilors? Council LaBarge. Um, yes. I, each one of you councilors do have a flyer at your desk. And um, the Youth and Heroin, a Valley Crisis, which we are hearing a tremendous amount of reports going on about youth throughout the state of Massachusetts and their problems of um, an overdose of heroin. It is scheduled for Monday, March 24th from 3 to 4.30. And District Attorney David E. Sullivan and also Jeremy Bacucci, I think Jesse, you know, Bucci, you know him well. Um, I do know in Greenfield, they did have a seminar and a forum on this, and it was full house. So if you counselors are available, please attend it. It will be um, on Gleason Street, 1 Gleason, Northampton from 3 to 4.30. And that's all you got to do is get a hold of Dave Sullivan's office and RSVP on that. Thank you. Any other one-minute announcements? No. Uh, just to let you know, Council Murphy has invited us all to the, uh, the breakfast, St. Patrick's Day breakfast, which will be held on the 17th at stupid o'clock in the morning. Seven. <laughs> so Seven. Just, just to catch Seven. us all, uh, yes. I think it's at 7, 7.30, Seven. Seven something like that. It's 7. Jesse, what does it say on the ticket? 7.30 to 9. 7.30 to 9 o'clock. As I said, stupid o'clock. So, but uh, the breakfast will be available to and counselors. Uh, Council Murphy's reserved us a table, so that we can they, people can focus their objects of derision more succinctly on our table. That's it for one minute announcements. Uh, unless anyone else has anything else, no. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll accept a motion for the approval of minutes. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion on the minutes? This is from February twentieth, twenty fourteen. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? We're up to the reports on committees. Uh, we have uh, committee reports from Transportation and Parking Commission. Those are the minutes of November 19, 2013, and September 17, 2013. And then the Committee on Public Safety minutes of February 3rd, 2014. Is it the pleasure to move them as a group? As a group. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, now we're up to appointments, and this is uh, a reappointment to the Board of Health, Suzanne Smith at 134 State Street, North in the term uh, beginning March 2014 and ending March 2017. Um, and I, does someone want to speak to this? Well, I, think, I think these are reappointments in typical. Right, these are, the, these are two reappointments. There's some reappointments that are coming up, but some are for referral. This will be... Yeah, I'll accept a motion. I'd move to suspend Rule 30. Okay. There's I'll a motion second to suspend that. rules. All those in favor of suspending rules for this appointment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, any discussions of the candidate? Um, any members of the former appointment committee who have who uh -huh. reviewed her? Uh, uh, oh, Council Murphy, you have? Yeah. Oh, no, just uh, it's Dr. Suzanne Smith who did a career with the CDC. So we're very fortunate to have her willing to serve on our Board of Health. So I very much encourage her reappointment. And just actually, uh, Dr. Suzanne Smith was elected by this by this council rather than referred from the uh, from the uh, yeah. mayor. Part so the old process. Uh, yeah. right, we had an opportunity the to interview her at the podium. And it was mm -hmm. the council. Uh, council of yes, And if I can recall, um, she's been on the board for about six years. I think it is. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of the reappointment of Dr. Suzanne Smith, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? 
Uh, next up is a reappointment to the Conservation Commission, Kevin Lake of 35 Washington Avenue in Northampton. The term beginning, of course, March 2014 <coughs> and ending March 27th. I move to um, suspend Rule 30. I'll second that. All those in favor of suspending rules, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Anyone who want to discuss, uh, discuss the candidate? Uh, Councilor uh, Spector. Well, I know this candidate's where he's been the uh, chair of the Conservation Commission. I think he's done an excellent job. I'm glad he's willing to continue to serve in this capacity. A man of remarkable calm temperament that should be a model for every one of us. Yes. Um, I, I hope he doesn't take it out at folks on, <laughs> in home or something. Because <laughs> <laughs> he is, uh, he is a, a very thoughtful person. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstentions? No. Next up are reappointments to the Zoning Board of Appeals. We have Sarah Northrop of 147 Hinckley Street in Florence, the term uh, beginning March 20, uh, 2013, ending March 2016. This is full membership. Uh, next up will be Elizabeth Silver of 67 Willow Street in Florence, the term beginning March 2013, expiring March 2016 as an associate member. And Malcolm Barry Smith, uh, 9 Park Street, Florence, the term beginning 2014 of this month and ending March 2017 also for I'd full I'd like membership. to take this as a group, all three of them, and suspend Rule 30. Second. Uh, any discussion on the suspension of rules? All those in favor of suspending rules, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, anyone want to speak to these candidates? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll simply say that actually, again, these, are, these people are eminently qualified and, and uh, stepping up to volunteer for a job that uh, is very difficult and protracted at times and um, again people of good temperament that I think would serve us well in this regard. Councilor Labarge, do you have something? Yes, to I, th I think with Elizabeth Silva she's been on the board, on the zoning board for about three years and Malcolm Smith has been on it for a long time. And may I think Sarah Northup has been on since uh, the mayor was once on. Uh, Sarah and Barry, so that tells you how much yeah. okay. you want to go. Okay. I think other stuff. And Sarah's an engineer, isn't she? Yes. yes. And Barry's Elizabeth is an attorney. Yeah. So they bring so really great skills to that board. Uh, they're very good and qualified people. Yeah, and then Barry Smith an attorney, too. So He's an attorney, too. So a good crew. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the members as a group being advanced to their membership and in Silver's case, associate membership, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. Um, this is a new appointment to the Community Preservation Committee. This is Linda Morley on Prospect Street, Northampton, the term starting January of this, of this year uh, and expiring January 2017, uh, replacing the expired term of Bill Breitbart. Um, and this would, I, I it's a accept referral. the motion to refer to uh, ordinance. Move to refer to ordinance. Second. All those in favor of the referral, please say aye. 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 Just a question. Would, is this a mayor's appointment? Is this, this is one of yours. This is mine. Okay. The mayor and the council. The mayor has an appointment. The council has an right. appointment. So it's yours. Okay. All right, now is the uh, time we're going to recess for finance, uh, and I cede the gavel to uh, Council Murphy, who's the chair of finance, and we go into recess. And convene. Uh, where did you call the roll of finance? Council Murphy? Here. Council, Alice? Here. Council Barnes? Present. Council Chair? Here. Right, the first issue is upon the recommendation of the Conservation Commission. Order as the open space and recreation and multi use plan for 2011 to 2018 recommends linking conservation areas along Broadbrook to enhance wildlife value and create continuous Broadbrook uh, Greenway. And whereas the Gleason family has agreed to sell two parcels totaling 20 acres plus or minus for $24,000 to add to the Broadbrook Greenway, Fitzgerald Lake, and whereas this acquisition will fill a major gap in the Greenway and Whereas all funds will be drawn from CPA conservation funds, Broadbrook coalition <coughs> contributions and community donations, and no additional appropriation is required for the purpose. And whereas the best way to address title and probate issues is for the city council to adopt a consensual order of taking 
for each of the two parcels. Now, therefore, it be ordered that the City Council does hereby approve the attached two consensual orders of taking to allow the Conservation Commission to acquire for conservation and passive recreation purposes as provided by Section 8C of Chapter 40 of the General Laws and the, uh, the Community Preservation Act, Article 97 of the amendments to the Massachusetts Constitution. Further, that the Conservation Commission is authorized to grant conservation restrictions and permissions to use existing farm access roads on any land so acquired. We have a motion on this one? So moved. Second. Second, okay. And I believe you have questions yes, for Mr. Like Mr. Fiden's here, and I'm sure he would recognize Mr. Fiden on the agenda, I think so. Mr. Fiden. So this is, you know, we've been building the Broadbrook uh, Greenway. These are two parcels, one of which is very much in, in holding. We own sort of on three sides of it, and one is a small expansion we own on one side. Um, we've been talking to the Gleason family about this for a number of years. It took a while for the deal to come together, but it, it has come, and we have CPA money already allocated for the, for the project. Um, Wayne, we're looking at 20 acres on this piece of property. Has this property ever been surveyed? We have a survey underway, so we've sur we're mostly at surveyed. The survey is not quite done yet. But, but it's not finished. It's not finished, right? Okay. And this indicates that we're taking it to clear up some title issues? That's correct. This has been the Gleason family for years. Uh, Gleason used to be a city solicitor, and this goes back to, I think, the 30s. And there was just some, uh, some title issue. Our purchase and sale agreement says we're allowed to take it by eminent domain, assuming they we pay them exactly the amount we had negotiated. So it's really just to clean this up. And they're not contiguous, right? One's on one side of the conservation. That's correct. Uh, the CR is Broadbrook controls the CR. No, it would be Kestrel Trust. It would be Kestrel Trust. Yeah, Broadbrook sort of trying to slowly get out of the CR business. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I can understand that. The um, and just for purposes of public explanation, this is what's also known as a friendly taking. That's correct. This is it's by mutual consent. This is not a, a land grab. Essentially. Right. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Any. Any questions from anyone? No. Anyone else on council? Other than no. And no other questions from finance. So that all in favor of a positive recommendation, please say aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Oh, you should have the other one. Just the public. Okay. All right. And more land. Upon the recommendation of the Department of Public Works, order that a city sewer line from Gothic Street towards King Street crosses the land of Kathleen Burke Foley, uh, the 2010 Revocable Trust located at 50 Street, Gothic Street, without the benefit of an expressed easement, therefore. Whereas Kathleen B. Foley, the trustee of said trust, is willing to grant an easement to the city for the maintenance and repair and replacement of the sewer line, now therefore be ordered that the city council authorizes the acquisition by gift, purchase, eminent domain, or otherwise of an easement in and over the parcel of land shown as as proposed 32 wide easement to be granted to the city of Northampton, its area is 2,739 square feet on a plan entitled easement plan dated December 4th, 2013 by Northeast Survey Consultants for the purpose of maintaining, repairing, and replacing sewer pipes, lines, uh, and all facilities within the easement area uh, and to enter and remain upon the easement area by foot vehicles or equipment for the purpose of maintaining, repairing, and replacing said sewer facilities and to grade as necessary in order to maintain the stability of the easement area. Uh, further, that no appropriation is necessary for the acquisition of the easement authorized here under. We have a motion on this one? So moved. Okay. And uh, I believe we have Mr. Laurel here if he wants to address this one or if you have any questions for him. I do. You do? Yeah. Move to recognize Mr. Laurel. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Perfect. Aye. You're on, sir. City solicitor could also speak to it if you would be great. Yeah, we're going to speak to. Be okay. Um, the city so solicitor has actually been um, working on in this, so if, if it would be possible to recognize Mr. Uh, I would like to Attorney, always good to see the solicitor. Second. Okay. I'll ask him the question. Very good. You got Mr. Laurel, Mr. Laurel off the hook on this. <laughs> he owes me one. There you go. Alan. Yes. Um, in question, looking at this. 
and I spent some time on it, and I said, what's going on here with this easement? Now, this sewer line has been there for a long time. Long time. Correct. Was there ever a break in it? I believe there was, and I believe there's been a repair on it. And there's That's been how it came up that uh, we didn't have a deeded easement. I've drafted the easement. So, and in other words, there was a break. It needed to be repaired, because that was my question. And that's when you found out that there, you couldn't get in there because of we that. We did get in there. I know we did, and I know that. Well, how could you get in there if you didn't? Oh. She granted us permission to come in and repair this flooding pipe, that sewer pipe that was under her driveway. So she was uh, willing to allow the city to come in and repair it. But now we want to formalize uh, the relationship. Okay, so if that repair, or if that had hap not happened, you would not have known about that easement or not? I certainly would not, not have known about the lack of an easement. Um, I, I would say that this is not an unusual condition around the city. There are a number of sewer lines that are laid without formal easements and that have been there a very long time. Okay. But that was we, my we thought question. we'd take the opportunity to formalize this since it does lead to a sewer main out uh, behind the property that, that runs north-south. And it would benefit her also. It would benefit all parties. There is some certainty when there is a deeded easement. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions from anyone? Great. Then all in favor of this easement, please say aye. 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 And I believe that concludes all our business. So motion to adjourn finance. So moved. Second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Ah. So we come out of recess. And we're back in the regular meeting. Yep. And <laughs> in our normally perfunctory manner, we're going to revisit those issues that we just discussed. <laughs> so, uh, um, Weave reading. <laughs> you want to weigh the reading? Okay. Uh, first up is the uh, conservation area along Broadbrook. Uh, I'll accept a motion and put it on the floor. Move to approve. Okay. Uh, Second. Any further discussion on this issue? That no. Roll call, please. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor yes. Councilor yes. Councilor yes. 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 All right. That passes in first reading. And next up is the financial order of uh, the authorization acquisition of an easement uh, at the Foley Trust, 53 Gothic Street. Move to approve. Second. Uh, motion to made and put on the floor. Is there any further discussion? Nope. Oh, yes. No. Ready? Oh. Yes. 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 Now, up in second reading is the approval of expenditure of $3,000 in gift funds from the Cronin family uh, gift account for scholarships to participants of the Northampton Rec Department programs. And as I said, the second reading. Uh, so moved. Second it. Any discussion on this? Yes. Yes, because Council of I was not here last time, um, two weeks ago. I, I want to thank the um, Cronin family for this wonderful gift. Um, of this account for scholarships for the Northampton Recreation Department. I think it's wonderful that we have families that come forth and participate with a tremendous amount of money like that. And that is a nice scholarship. So I want to thank them. It's a very appropriate expression of gratitude, and I agree. So thank you. Uh, any further discussion on this? Uh, roll call, please. Yes. 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 Also, next up is a uh, to re reprogram eighteen thousand dollars from the Bridge Street School Detention uh, Basin Project for the purpose of replacing bathroom partitions. To, uh, so we, David Pomerantz presented on this at the last meeting. Um, I'll accept a motion to put it on the floor. Move to approve. Second. Any further discussion on this issue? Councilor Barge and then Councilor Adams. Yes, um, I think this is absolutely necessary, being the only school um, where apparently there has been no partition work at all or upgrades in that school. 
at all on the petitions. Councilor Adams. No. Any other discussion? Hit it, Mary. Yes. 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 Uh, this is up for referral. This is to amend uh, Chapter 312-36. Whoa. Oh, I'm, ba oh, I'm skipping into ordinances. I'm sorry. I probably freaked everybody out. What? What storm are Is that? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm sorry. Just, I had a stroke for fine. Right, we're actually going to go discuss stormwater at this point. Um, what is the council's pleasure on proceeding with this? Go ahead. Do you Council want to get the referrals out of the way? I mean, do you want to? Is it do you want to get the referrals out of the way? Yes. Just suggestion. Um, I, I think that's not a terrible idea. With the council want to get clean up the end of the uh, <laughs> the agenda, which is pretty quick, and <laughs> we can get we can concentrate on that. So 40. This one here. Oh, okay. This is to amend uh, 44.3, then that's accounts, and this is the second reading actually on the. Vote to approve. That. Second reading, please. And waiver reading, okay. Uh, any discussion on that? Mary? I do have a question. Yes. I, don't, I lost my internet connection. Can you just remind us what are we voting on? Not reading the whole thing, but you could maybe summarize. It's that. it. If if you recall, it was, was reordering was deleting the printing expenditure yes, okay. for, the, for the ordinance it's committee, and then reordering the entire Got list it. so yeah. that it would. Reflect. Thank you. Okay. Um, any further discussion on everyone's up to speed on that? Mary, would you please call the roll? Yes. 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 And this is to, uh, uh, for referral, this is to amend uh, 312-36 parking meter locations and regulations, private shared vehicle services, and this is to be referred to ordinance. I move to refer. Second, but I also would like to move to refer to Ectolu. You want to add the referral to Ed Lou as well? Surely. Uh, so the motion's been made to refer to uh, ordinance and Ed Lou. Any discussion on the referral? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and then finally is the fee structure for certain permits simplified, and that's to be referred to ordinance. Uh, I'll accept the motion. So, second. So this is to refer to ordinance. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, let's get to it. Okay. Let's go to work. This is uh, this discussion will um, be adding a stormwater and flood control utility ordinance, establishing an enterprise fund. Second. All right, it's on the floor. Um, how do you want to? How does the council want to proceed with this, Council? I'd actually just like to start with some thank yous on this. No matter how we, the discussion goes. Sure. I, I want to thank the. Um, Stormwater Task Force, um, by name in a moment. These folks were asked, if you remember those of us on the council, we, we kind of tried to lasso people into this. I remember asking people, and I, I think we had great people on this, and I remember as one of the people organizing this, telling other counselors, well, tell them it'll probably be two or three meetings, because they're being charged with the, just two questions. And we had some, I, I think it was one of the, the most amazing committees I've seen working in the time I've been on the council. And they met, turned out, I, I think I've got the count right, 16 times. And they met for almost six months. And we had asked them two things uh, to do. So that's why I thought they could do one in one meeting, the other in the other, and then a little holdover in the third. We asked them to, to look at the question of, do we need <coughs> to do this? And what is the extent of the work? And do we need to do it? And they quickly said yes. And then the second question was, then how do we pay for it? And that was what took quite a bit of time. And I want to thank them. I want to thank the chair, Emery Ford, and the vice chair, Dan Felton, Rick Clark, Jim Dostal, Alex Gieselin, Chris Hellman, Ruth McGrath, 
Megan Wolf, Bob Reckman, John Stennett, and David Tees. I think they did a great job. I also want to recommend that anybody watching at home, if you go to the home page of the uh, City of Northampton's website, you will see a link to the Stormwater Committee, and you can see the report that they made. And I think that's representative of, of the incredible work that this group did. Uh, so again, irregardless of where we head tonight with this and how we vote and where the discussion is, these folks put in a huge amount of time and effort and they really helped to guide this discussion and, and to frame it in a way that we could have the debate we're having tonight. Councilor Murphy. Mm -hmm. And I've got some thank yous too, and, and that would be this all really got to start in the conference committee, the, the city council, DPW conference committee, and the two city council reps that got it started were Councilor Spector and Councilor Adams, and they have been involved in this since the very beginning. I know in ordinance we thanked everybody under the sun, but we haven't had a chance to thank our members of the conference committee who really got this got this going and got all everything else underway. So thank you, gentlemen, for that. I, and I also want to thank former Councilor Tacey, yes. who's also who's in, in that involved. committee and, and helped support this and move this forward. Council, Councilor Tacey was a strong advocate for the necessity of this and, yeah. um, and, and oftentimes led the way in the discussion. So props to all involved and, and the good work. And now it's our job to do the good work. So. Um, we can start from the top. There's, there's a series of proposed amendments. Um, I'm not sure which document would be the preference for people to start with. My inclination is to start with, I'm sorry. Well, I would, go, I would recommend that we, after our ordinance committee meeting, we did ask the uh, Jim Luria to put together that packet of uh, amendments. That's, that's a good point. I think it's important to recognize all the yeah. people that we're going to talk to. Yeah. And, and my motion was for the, um, my, I moved the, the uh, order as most recently amended with corrections by the solicitor. So it came out of ordinance and then it was further amended mostly for form by the solicitor. So that's the version I was moving, the, the most recent version. I would ask that you, oh, Councilor Adams. I have a question. It, it are, isn't before us the the, the ordinance that was um, amended at ordinance um, without the solicitor's recommendation. Right. So we would have to incorporate the those would have to be those tonight. After that, okay, yeah. thank you. Right. Just clarifying. Um, I would ask the council to let's get our recognitions out of the way uh, for people that we're going to have come up. So I would accept a motion to, to recognize staff, uh, Susan Wright. Uh, Attorney Seawall, although he's recognized in finance, let's let's Colhane, Terry Colhane, Terry Colhane, Terry. and Terry Colhane and Jim, yeah. Doug, Doug, and uh, you want to recognize Chad Kane? Uh, <laughs> I'd like to, even, in, case, in case we need him, I need to recognize Dan Felton, who's the vice chair from the, Felton, task force. Uh, from the task force. Mm -hmm. So I'll accept a motion to some of those recognition. Oh, second. recognize the crowd. All those in favor of recognizing the people that remain with the exception of Chad Kane. Please say aye. 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 You're out. <laughs> um, okay. Well, Jim, you want to start start us off and and uh, or Terry? You want Terry to speak for us? Yeah. Um, Terry is the is the chair of the board of public works. He's also been. It's basically a walking point on this project, and um, and they are the committee that helped craft this document that you see before us today. Um, Terry, I'm not sure. I think virtually every counselor here has heard the history, the arc of the history, to the point where we could almost recite it as well as you at this point. But if you could provide a, a thumbnail on where we are now. Where we are in terms of the ordinance? Yeah. Okay. And at this point, we're talking about the ordinance as passed by the ordinance. Well, how about I make it easier? Why don't you speak to the question that uh, Council Murphy, as the chair of ordinance, had charged uh, the, the 
colliding amendments, uh, asking Councillor Adams and you uh, if you guys were able to negotiate uh, revised language for for the issues that <coughs> you can. All right. So, Councillor Dwight is talking about the proposed amendment M. Uh, this amendment. spoke directly to the issue of administrative indirect expenses. Um, lumped into the broad category of indirects are some which everyone agrees are completely legitimate. Uh, employee benefits, their retirement benefits, their health insurance, life insurance in some cases. Um, the city pays, for example, the city engineer entirely out of the general fund but his work is spread across the uh, enterprise funds in addition to his work for the general fund. And uh, those portions that are deal with the enterprise funds are recovered through indirect charges. So there are a number of areas where the indirects are non-controversial. The two points of controversy that Amendment M was attempting to address were administrative indirects, which would cover departments within City Hall the assessor's office, the uh, uh, city clerk, the treasurer's office, the mayor's office, the city council. Um, and in the end, I understand that the mayor has made a proposal to walk through each of those offices and, in a sense, look at them line by line to correct those charges. Instead of just a broad sweeping X percent across the whole spread, to look at it one department at a time and come up with justifiable, accurate numbers for each department. And he's proposed to do that, as I understand it, across all four enterprise funds if this one is approved. Um, I think that proposal eliminated some of the need for Amendment M. Um, um, it, if you could stop there for a second, then Councilor Adams actually, you, or you want to weigh in on this? Um, so there, there was no compromise reached. Um, I, I, it probably is too complex to be done in in in, in an amendment. Um, but it, but I think the point is an important one. Um, the purpose was that this fund should not go to as some as you stated in, in the ordinance committee meeting uh, to pay for salaries for people who would be there with or without the fee. This should go to specifically what it's for for stormwater and flood control, and now and that's what that's what that's how we sold this to to the city to the city. Um, so, you know, ideally, I would have liked to have seen um, an, an an amendment that could have been incorporated into this ordinance and used as a model for the other enterprise funds, but that didn't happen, and um, and and it didn't happen because I think the the parties involved in in the in in M. Um, instead are deferring to the mayor and and um, his review of all the enterprise funds and the indirect costs in all the enterprise funds so I really hope that that conversation goes forward so what's what's your pleasure uh, to the um, I'll withdraw it. and and just to, to keep us straight at which level we're dealing with this ordinance at the ordinance committee we blended the original ordinance with recommendations from DPW and a considerable number of recommendations from Councillor Adams and, uh, and Councillor O'Donnell. O'Donnell. And we sent those forward as one, as an amended ordinance. Then M, which uh, Councillor Adams has now withdrawn, was sent here without recommendations so we could deal with it here. And then subsequently, the solicitor looked at the ordinance and made some more changes to it. And so their their M is gone now, but we still have the way it came out of ordinance and recommendations from the solicitor. And though I, I, I theoretically moved it with the solicitor's changes included in it, if you wish to deal with it as it came out of ordinance, now minus M and then let the solicitor discuss the issues he had with it in his final review, and then incorporate them here. That's probably a more proper way to do it. Well, it's it's what I was considering. I wanted to, I wanted to address the issue of M first. Uh, and people think we're talking a Bond film at this point, mm -hmm. um, but M has been withdrawn. 
So now we have two documents essentially, one with one that came to uh, through ordinance and then the other one that includes the solicitor's annotations and recommendations. So if we if the council wants to proceed point by point, we can do that and we can actually have the solicitor well, just come Just a question, uh, uh, yeah. even, though, even though it's been moved and seconded on the floor, is it appropriate at this point to move the amendments that were offered in order for, di for us to discuss yeah, those? Yeah, and that's, I mean, I think yes. because we have a series of amendments and um, I'm wondering if you guys want to do it amendment. One by a time? Yes. One at a time? I okay. Councilor Murphy. I, I actually like to hear the solicitor because okay. those yes. things, the solicitor's recommendations have not really been aired publicly, so to speak. I'd love to have Solicitor Seawall come up and tell us what his proposed changes are and why, and then, and then we, can we can determine can if we want to deal with them one by one or whether we want to take them as a group. But I don't think we've all had them explained to us yet. So yes. that, that so I, I would be in favor of that. Councilor Klein. Point of clarification. So if we hear um, Attorney Seawald's justification for all of this or explanation of all of this, are they then um, amendments per se, or does this need to be recrafted with well, it, as it, it, it depends. They could be amendments if they if they reach an even larger threshold. They may even need to be. It may need something even more dramatic. So, mm -hmm. but as it stands, the the, uh, the solicitor, for all practical intents and purposes, the final word on the legal construct of the document and its validity. Mm -hmm. And Councilor Adams, when you say more dramatic. What do you mean? Like a referral back to committee? That's a possibility too. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean something something a, a, with a higher threshold. Um, so, um, I, I think what Council Murphy's saying is let's let's get that all aired out so everyone's understanding uh, what the solicitor is recommending. Then we can, in the, and since the sponsors of the, all the amendments are, are present, then they can speak to their amendments also as we address those. Uh, Council O'Donnell, I, I agree. We should take the solicitor's amendments point by point so we all understand and the public understands them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, is that the consensus of the committee? I mean, I'm not going to take a vote, but uh, uh, Solicitor Seawald is here. Thank you, Alan. And um, you want to take it from the top? Let's take it from the top. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the First Amendment that I've offered, um, let me just say that, that um, the, the amendments that I offered fall into the category of clarifications, um, just cleaning up some of the language be, uh, as someone who's read a lot of ordinances, bylaws, and statutes over the years. I just try to uh, change some of the language so that it reads more like uh, an ordinance. Um, and some of them are more substantive. Let me start with the uh, definitional section in, I don't think there was any amendment. There were any amendments. You know, there only was a data. Yes. Uh, 280-4 is the definitional section. Um, I have proposed amending the definitional section uh, with regard to direct costs and indirect costs. The, the proposed amendments are simply to define those terms the way the DOR defines those terms, um, the way they're defined by the state. Um, and that will um, eliminate any question as to what is meant by these, these terms. Um, Direct costs, I think we all know what direct costs are. They are the, the, the costs directly attributable, not budgeted anywhere else. They're budgeted in the, um, they would be budgeted in the Stormwater Enterprise Fund budget. Um, and they, they would uh, uh, be very typical direct costs, the cost of the actual employees and materials and all of the, uh, the things that are necessary for the operation and maintenance of the system. Indirect costs are less obvious. Um, indirect costs generally are costs that are initially budgeted to some uh, to the general fund budget and then are uh, moved from the general fund budget or reimbursed from the, from the enterprise fund. They are shown in the budget of the enterprise funds but as a lump sum number as indirect costs. Um, and uh, as I understand from our finance director, um, and so this reflects the fact that um, there is a significant amount of time spent by employees who are general fund employers, I'll call them that, 
who spend time directly working on this enterprise fund and every enterprise fund, then these enterprise funds could not operate without them. If the collector's not collecting the money, then the funds are not coming in. And so to the extent that there are folks in the collector's office who are spending time on this enterprise fund, this enterprise, the idea is for the enterprise fund to be self-supporting unless you all decide, the mayor and you decide that uh, tax revenues should be used to support the enterprise fund. But that's not generally the purpose of the enterprise fund. So uh, this simply defines indirects the way the DOR defines them. The DOR has become much more attentive to indirect costs in enterprise funds, and I'm sure that the finance director could speak to that much more directly. I know that the DOR has looked at our enterprise fund policy last uh, July, I believe it was, and um, had no problem with the way we were proceeding on indirect costs to our enterprise fund. Um, but the days of simply any possibility of just um, wholesale general fund shifting of costs to an enterprise fund are over at the DOR. Uh, to the extent they ever exist, they don't exist today, and the DOR is quite attentive to indirect costs in the enterprise funds. Councilor Adams, you have a question? My question is, but doesn't the DOR allow for our own definitions of indirect costs? It does, but if they're not reasonable, the DOR will reject them. But, but in your definition, I mean, so you, you, you um, use the DOR's definitions in your amendment. I use we are language from the DOR as they describe them. It's not a definition from the DOR, but it's a description that the DOR has put out in, its, in, uh, in the Enterprise Fund Manual and in other publications that they put out. And I've tried to use the descriptions that the DOR has used uh, to describe indirect costs, because it is somewhat um, not as obvious on its face as the direct costs. But we can, we can create our own definitions for them as long as they're reasonable. You, we can create our own policy as long as it's reasonable, yes. And, and by the way, just for clarification, DOR is Department of Revenue for Councilor Carney. Uh, just as a follow-up, so in the definition you offer for indirect costs, is the language that refers to the example of the collector's office, is that something taken from the general? Yes. The, uh, that's right. directly, th th that's what they would consider an indirect yes. cost. Thank that you. would be that exactly what, and I think believe this language is exactly from the DOR manual. Thank you, Councilor Martin. So the DOR is particularly concerned that municipalities don't try to slip general fund activities over to an enterprise fund. Absolutely, that's what they're looking for is to make sure we're not trying to offload general government expenses and slip them into an enterprise fund. And I know Ms. Wright has had direct communications with the DOR about our existing enterprise funds. Okay. Um, so they want to make sure that those costs are really related to the enterprise fund and that we're not right. trying to sneak general government stuff into that burden. I'm not going to represent that the DOR is going to require exactitude in that, but being reasonable is, is the way the DOR uh, approaches it. Mm -hmm. Councilor LaBarge. Um, Attorney Seawall, say for like an example with the landfill and with the enterprise fund, looking at the amount of money that came out of that enterprise fund, which was part of the mayor's pay, part of city council pay. So is this the same thing we're talking about as far as benefits and employees and so forth? We're talking about uh, general fund employees who actually spend some of their time uh, on the enterprise fund and reimbursing the general fund for the costs or the value of those employees spending their time on the enterprise fund as opposed to general fund activities. Now, um, I'm sure the mayor or, or Ms. Wright could speak uh, better to this than I can, but the idea is that perhaps we would need fewer employees in perhaps the collector's office if the collectors weren't also collecting enterprise fund collections and, um, and doing non-general fund activities. Okay, so. I attended out of the 15, there were 15, I think, stormwater task force committee meetings, and I attended 11, the, 11 of them, and I have every tape that's been recorded. And it mentioned, they did mention in the process that they thought it was a good idea of 
having a cap, can you actually have a cap in this enterprise fund? Well, Which I know, Councillor Adams, you had suggested that way back in late fall. I also heard the Board of Public Works that hearing saying that we were looking at capping for five years. My question is, which I saw tonight, an article I'm from- Barge, Excuse me, we're actually getting ahead of ourselves uh, because okay. uh, I have a feeling that we're going to spend a great deal of time discussing that. On program, that one? On that okay. Yeah. So, so my so. question then on this, thank you, Bill, You're welcome. is um, this would be treated almost similar to like the landfill enterprise fund uh, I, I I don't want to speak to the end of uh, the landfill enterprise fund because I've never been involved in the landfill enterprise well, that fund that was prior to my time as city solicitor and so I would not really want to comment uh, perhaps there's somebody from the finance side who could comment on that but I'm not really qualified to comment on that. Uh, if you're saying that would it be analogous to the solid waste enterprise and the water and the sewer enterprise fund in that um, yeah. For example, the time that the finance director spends working on the admit, on the enterprise funds, the time that the auditor and the outside auditor and the collector uh, would be a portion of that would be attributable. Yes, it's the same. Uh, it's the same methodology. Thank you. Yes, and Your Honor, while while you're up, the the, the principal concern for indirects, if I'm not mistaken, the purpose of indirects is to avoid redundancy and creating special expenditures and reduce efficiencies by creating whole new positions in order to address issues that can be addressed within city offices? Is that the impetus for this? The uh, well, I mean, the, uh, you know, for example, the bill collection um, service. I mean, we have a collector's office that collects other bills for the city, property tax bills, uh, um, uh, you know, deals with licensing, deals with other kinds of, you know, that's their job. And so in most, um, you know, in most cities and towns that have an enterprise fund, like a water or sewer, generally those bills are are handled by the collector's office, um, as opposed to the enterprise fund hiring its own bill collector, um, and so that's sort of the sort of the efficiency that that cities and towns use in these cases. And so you know that's the best example I could give you. Uh, you know, the city solicitor's time, for example. Um, you know, when you have that uh, presumably that easement, that a sewer easement. Um, so the, you know, the sewer enterprise fund needed to have an attorney draw up an easement for that sewer line. Um, so I guess we could ask the DPW to hire its own lawyer or they use the city solicitor and a portion of the hours that he spends working on sewer enterprise legal work gets charged to the sewer enterprise fund. So that's actually a very, a very recent example that you've dealt with tonight. Um, so that's sort of the way it's structured. Um, and it is true, we have been uh, looking at these uh, costs, um, and uh, the DOR is uh, doing a survey across the state. Um, they've obviously appro approved our latest methodology, uh, but we've been trying to be proactive and look at um, our own methodology in-house uh, so that we can develop uh, you know, more up-to-date methodology, and we're going to be presenting that as part of our FY15 budget. That's the, uh, the commitment that counselors have been referring to. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. Uh, any other questions to this proposed change? I, uh, um, the, the next change that I have is um, changing the word greater to more. It's just a clarification. It's just a word that I've seen used in statutes for greater. I, I've seen for a more, not for a greater. Um, in the non-residential property definition, um, the the addition to that definition were uses that were excluded from the not from the residential property definition, but never included anywhere else. So I plugged them in there so that they were somewhere, um, and uh, and that's just a clarification cleanup. Um, uh, if I could. Move to uh, 280 6, and um, I, I, I must say, I do feel like the skunk at the garden party at this moment. But um, uh, I, I, I just want to say, as um, this background, um, I, I hadn't seen this in any formal way since the addition of the, um, of the limitations on revenue raising through the enterprise fund after the fifth year. 
I had seen that back in September, and I, I, I recognized that. But uh, I hadn't seen it going out uh, essentially forever. And it occurred to me um, that we are now be binding uh, future mayors forever to be recommending or to be plugging in a $2 million plus some inflation factor forever. That's what the ordinance provided. And it occurred to me, now wait a minute, is that appropriate to bind future mayors to a certain budgetary process when it is the mayor who has the discretion and the authority to recommend budgets? So I, I contacted uh, Kathleen Leary, who's the uh, chief of the, uh, uh, the local uh, municipal finance law bureau at DOR, and I asked her, and she said, oh, no, no, no. That's not permissible. And, um, and so that's what led me uh, to propose my amendments that are contained in 280-6. And you should have a copy of Attorney Kaliri's um, email to me in your packet. Um, and um, what I've tried to do, and if I could just give an overview of what I tried to do to avoid any impact on the budgeting process, um, is to move the cap from the budgeting process over to the Board of Public Works. In my amendment, the Board of Public Works would be required to recommend to the mayor a budget of $2 million on the revenue side, and the mayor would be free to accept or reject that uh, recommendation, just as the mayor is free to accept or reject any recommendation from any other department. And these budgets are treated just like any other departmental budget. Um, and so uh, the mayor would have the same authority to decrease the amount that, uh, that uh, BPW has recommended, increase it, or, or accept it. And that's the process of budgeting. When it gets to this body, uh, you all always have the right to reduce budgets. You don't have, in generally speaking, you don't have the right to increase budget amounts, but you do have a right to decrease budget amounts, and that's the process. And so I've tried to, to strike a balance between keeping the cap, moving it over to the Board of Public Works, um, and um, leaving the budget process intact. So that's what you'll, you'll see in 280-6 A and B. Um, I had included, and I'm not sure where we are with this, but I had included um, uh, something of a, um, uh, the ability for the Board of Public Works to, to provide the, the mayor with specific reasons that it cannot stay within the $2 million cap on revenue. For instance, my concern was that if we uh, if the city were mandated by the state or the federal government to do things and they cost more than $2 million, we're going, uh, uh, the, the enterprise fund statute would require you, the city, to put that on the tax levy. So that would be paid through taxes. Um, the idea here is to sustain the enterprise with the funds that are coming in through the enterprise and not to, uh, to subsidize it with taxation. You can. That's completely within the mayor and your authority through the budgeting process. You can deliberately subsidize the enterprise fund with tax dollars, but that's generally not the idea of an enterprise fund. Councilor Murphy. Mm -hmm. So what this does is encourage the DPW to stay with that $2 million limit. But say we have a hurricane and it takes out a piece of the flood control dike and DPW comes to the mayor and says, we need some more money to make a repair to this catastrophic problem and we recommend that it come from this fund. And the mayor comes to us and says, this is the recommendation I've got. Then it falls on this body because we approve each of the enterprise fund, enterprise fund budgets individually mm -hmm. and then the entire budget. If we concur, yes, this is a catastrophic problem, and we want to assign it to flood control because it damaged flood control, we could choose to do that. Correct. But we'd still have the approval of it. The mayor still has the... the mayor has to bring it forward and we have to approve you it. And you and then you okay. approve it. Okay. That's the same process. Um, you know, my thought process was more uh, along the line that, that uh, DEP or the federal government comes and says, next year we're going to require you to do this. And the DPW says, oh. there's no way that we could do that for $2 million. 
uh, my proposal would be for them to state very specifically why it is that they need more than $2 million, such as the federal government is requiring us to do X, Y, and Z next year, and there's no way we can do that with $2 million and make a recommendation for something higher than $2 million. The mayor still has to bring it forward, and we still have to approve it. And, you, and if the mayor brings it forward, you still have the right to reduce it. Councilor O'Donnell. Um, I just want to ask a question for my own understanding. Um, sections B and C, mm -hmm. this part. B and C essentially say the same thing, except that B tells us we can't account for inflation for the first five years. Is that correct? Essentially, yes. Yes. Is, is that... Is that strange to you in any way? <laughs> not trying to lead you. Not trying to lead the uh, I, you know, I don't want to characterize it. Um, I have not experienced ordinances or bylaws. I spent many years as a town council, so I've done a lot of bylaw work as well. But I've never uh, experienced an ordinance or a bylaw that had caps like this at all, because that's just generally not the budgeting process. But in terms of inflation, I mean, we, we we only start to account for inflation after five years. Correct. Okay. Councilor Adams. If I'm reading it correctly, you correct me if I'm wrong, that's, that was your intent to keep with, with the spirit of what I was trying to do, and that's why it might look slightly funny. Uh, it might, what you're pointing out is, is because I think he's trying to um, keep the spirit of what I was trying to do, but legally. Right. Uh, the, the, the five years with no inflation increase was not my idea. That was what was <coughs> in the ordinance. Yeah. I just moved that? that to the Board of Public Works as opposed to binding the mayor to do that. Oh, you're right. Thank you. Councilor Adams, yeah. Councilor Murphy. So just to clarify, the, 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 um, the task force recommendations was that there would be no increase for five years right. at all. And now we've learned that that's, that's not legal. Um, and so there, now there will be no increase unless the BPW has a good reason for it. And just to clarify, that that's not the same thing, but that's 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 what we have, and and and, and because well, this is permissible, and, and the original recommendation wasn't. And similarly with my with my cap, so um, they're not the same. But this is, I guess, the best that can be done legally. So, Councilor Murphy, and just reader, the buck still stops with the mayor and us. Absolutely, because it always does it. Whatever DPW does, the mayor's got to buy it, and we have to buy it to fund it. So, exactly. And then conversely, we should not forget that this also allows the mayor the authority, a future mayor or future council, to actually reduce the two million dollars, yeah. mm -hmm. to go below the cap, and to to provide relief if it's if it's considered um, mm -hmm. a, 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 a worthwhile, and, and that's built in flexibility. Councilor Speck. Well, I just want to say, Councilor Adams, I believe, brought this forward because. It, as you said, he's been involved with this from the beginning. We, and one of the comments we heard over and over was a concern. So the intent of this was, you know, a public concern that we heard, and we heard this from the Chamber of Commerce, we heard it from individuals of, hey, how come the, this, this might just go up to $9 million next year? And that, yeah, it's $60 now, but how do we know? So we were trying to address that. I think this, this does do that. It's not quite as clean as Councilor Adams' amendment, but that's not legal. But I think the intent here is the same thing. The intent is to say, look, we're going to, to keep a cap on this. We're trying to say to the public, this is not going to just suddenly, two years from now, be up to some unknown fee. And it was trying to address those concerns, which we heard and Councilor Adams heard over and over again from people. And so I think this does this, is, is addressing the same thing in its intent. Well, and, and also it should be pointed out that um, by codifying it originally, um, actually was almost redundant in that the council always held and still holds the authority to reduce. And uh, this, in fact, actually that excused the council from owning the fee in some level. And then at this point now, essentially the council's responsible for it. So the, the, so the citizens and the taxpayers understand that any authorization to exceed the $2 million is on the council. And any authorization to reduce, and, and uh, as you said, we have the authority to reduce and or keep it at $2 million. And we have to make, or in future councils have to make, and are obliged to make a, a justification to the community as it goes forward. So that responsibility is still born. And um, this was an attempt to actually codify it, but 
it is codified in, in, in a less distinct way, a less bright line, as, as Councilor Spector and Councilor Adams have said. The line is not quite so bright, but the effect is virtually the same and with greater understanding and acknowledgement of our responsibilities. Uh, if I could just clarify, the, the buck stops with the mayor and the council. Right. And then the mayor, the other part of this was the mayor was kind of written out of the whole budgeting right. process in the original uh, draft. And so I, I also amended it to the mayor's. Right. But my, my point on the on that line of authority, we actually do have the authority to reduce the mayor's do. recommendation. Absolutely. Yes. So, so just so everyone's clear on the division of power and that, that ultimately, uh, the council owns responsibility for the final line and disposition of the of, of that budget. And I would also point out that even if it were left the way Council Adams had it in there, five, if if five councilors were in favor of uh, exceeding that two million, those same five councilors could amend the ordinance and exceed the two million. So um, it it it's not the protection the, that one might really think it is simply because it's in the ordinance. Council Murphy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so in Wells the Mayor and ourselves, and I'm talk about a body that's directly reviewed by the voters, you know, they they grant us permission to continue every two years. So if we're going somewhere the public doesn't want us to go, they can actually do something about that. And pretty directly. Um, other questions on this point? Um, please continue, Al. Um, the mayor pointed out that I did miss one change I made. I corrected the reference to the statute from 53E right. to 53F and a half. I hope that's not controversial. Um, in 280-7, um, I had spoken with Mr. Larla about this. I, I wasn't re it wasn't really clear to me what was being uh, stated there. I tried to clean this up and make it uh, clear that what this section is trying is attempting to do is to delineate who is responsible for stormwater facilities in various locations. The upshot being that if this if it's in a public way, or if the city has uh, an access easement either on uh, land owned by another governmental entity or private parties, the city would be responsible for the maintenance. Uh, an operation of this, um, the system, and if it's on private property or other property that the city doesn't have access to, um, that it uh, would be the private landowner's responsibility to maintain. And I was just trying to clarify that with language that's clear. Are there any questions on that point? Okay, thank you. And if I'm not mistaken, the, uh, the last one is 280-13, which is a pet peeve of mine. Um, having a subsection A and no subsection B. When there's no subsection B, you don't need a subsection A. I don't know why that's always been a pet peeve of mine, but it is. <laughs> and that's the extent of my. Uh, I object to that one. Well, so the city has a surplus of per, uh, parentheses, and we need to apply them wherever we can. <laughs> we don't want to waste our A's and B's. Are there any questions holistically on that? document that has been recommended by the city solicitor. Um, this, so that, what we just reviewed, the, the solicitor's comments is also what's the reflection of the amendments that were forwarded through the ordinance committee. Do we want to start to address the amendments as I they come up? I think okay. yeah. Councilor I, I mean, uh, Councilor I just have a question about the sure. process. Um, you know, we received this document this afternoon with the city solicitor's comments and changes, and I didn't have a chance because I was at work to actually even look at it. And it just seems like there's probably something, I mean, I don't know enough about the how the process needs to look, but the fact that we received this so late um, that it was reviewed at the very last minute, I'm just not clear why this we, we didn't get this feedback from the city solicitor weeks ago, for that matter. And I'd like some clarification about what the process and, is supposed and I, to be. And I think you're addressing that to the solicitor, and I would also say that um, I think we would have benefited from the solicitor being present in ordinance. I think that would have helped a lot in some respect. I think there is, uh, if, is, is the process was ongoing, a uh, more direct request from the solicitor. If the solicitor were uh, able to, able to or did in fact, respond more promptly, 
I mean, the other holdup was he was waiting to hear from the DOR, uh, which and I think you got that last night. The response. Uh, uh, did I get it yesterday? Yeah. Yeah, yesterday. And so, it, but all things being equal, I agree. I think that um, this is pretty short order, and I think and you're not alone in that concern and in expressing that uh, concern. And um, clearly, the process would be much improved with earlier notification discussion about the, 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 the legal structure of any, any ordinances that we advance. Um, in this instance, if it reaches your threshold, and, and I've said this to other counselors, if it reaches the threshold of your concern that you feel that, that um, you are not comfortable advancing this based on your absence of study or scrutiny, that there are options available to us um, and one of them would be to um, delay uh, if you wanted to table uh, if you want a minority reconsideration it would be required you to, to have a vote and then you actually present yourself in the minority by voting no or yes depending which is the minority if it's voted no in the majority it's a done deal boom it's dead so I'm guessing but I'm making a lot of people uncomfortable right now with this explanation, by the way. And uh, the other is, is <laughs> yes, yes, that there is, a, there is essentially some time pressures because the mayor has to present this consolidated in a budget. And it would be my intent if we were to delay this through a, a charter question um, to have another meeting ASAP, a special meeting where we would convene so that we can finish and complete this in this month. But that's, that's, if and only if it's re if you are not comfortable with the description and the presentation that the city solicitor has made. I'm Mr. also Chair. just interested in knowing if there's somebody on ordinance that knows whether or not this is in fact, um, it's, this has been processed in the legal manner so that we're not um, moving on something today that wasn't actually, didn't follow legal process. Uh, Councilor Adams and Councilor Speck. I'm oh, sorry. Our, our, our Rule 36 proposed new ordinances, ordinances states um, at or before the meeting at which the ordinance committee considers any matter for approval and or recommendation, the city solicitor shall examine the matter's form and legal character. So, I mean, sh she is correct. It, it, it actually is contrary to our rules. And um, I think these are significant changes. Um, but it's not just you know it's it's more than just your inclination. It's actually it's actually a rule that that, it's, that that's what actually ordinance is for. Um, so, and I know the city solicitor takes full responsibility for that, and I know this is an oversight. But um, it's my hope that in the future, that this rule is complied with because this is an enormous ordinance, and there are major changes at the last moment. Thank you. Just a, just a couple of points. One is that. You know, at times the whole thing of second readings, I go, second reading, do a second reading on everything. But the point of a second reading sometimes is that new information comes up. Sometimes new information comes up between the first vote and the second vote. I've seen that happen on occasion. So we do still have time on this. I mean, if this is significant enough to change your vote, then, you know, we have an option on that. And I think part of the debate on this is, is this a significant change? And I think each of us will have a different opinion. My feeling is the intent of this is still the same and it's within a legal framework. So it's not really changing what was intended by Councilor Adams's uh, initial amendment. It's just putting it in a different framework. But we can each disagree about that, you know, that particular thing. But um, I certainly understand the concern about voting on something that you just received. But again, when it, when it would be a big change, but that may be what we need to debate. Is this a significant change? That's, that's the big question. Is this, is this new language changing the, changing the ordinance so, so significantly we say, wait, I need to look at this. And I, I need to actually not only look at it between the first two readings, but I don't even want to do a first reading tonight. Council Murphy and then Council Sharon. Just for how this process came about, ordinance had a special meeting on the 25th solely to deal with this issue. On the and I believe that Councilor Seawall had looked at the ordinance as it originally came from DPW some time ago. Last fall. Yeah, uh, last fall. So on the 25th of February in a special meeting, that is when ordinance blended additional DPW recommendations, recommendations 
uh, from two counselors and blended it together. So it was only after February 25th that the sort of the final version that was recommended to come to council came together. So Attorney Sewell really didn't have a lot of time to review it. He'd seen it, the original version, but the final version that was coming here didn't actually exist put together. I, I think uh, Mr. Lorela probably put it together on Wednesday, the 26th of February. So it really wasn't that much time that passed between the composite version of the ordinance and it coming here before Attorney Sewell got it and we said, okay, here's the version that's actually going to council. So a lot of time really didn't pass there for his review. So I don't really, you know, think he was delinquent in looking at it in a timely manner since it really didn't exist in its final form until the 26th, I think, was when I first saw the version of it. Um, and then it went to him and he, he said, okay, this is the final version that's going to council. Let me take another look at it. So I, I don't really feel that there was really a lot of time wasted there. And given, given Attorney C. Wall's recommendations, <coughs> And, and his respect to the, you know, trying to get the cap in there somewhere. I don't personally feel that this has changed so substantially with his cleaning up the language that it's something we need to send back to committee. I think whatever whatever changes we need to do, if we need to do any, we could accomplish between first reading and second reading. You know, and I know there's another recommendation coming that, that may be the same way. We could we could accomplish those between first and second reading. Council Shara and then Council Labarch. Um, I, I guess I just like clarification on what Councillor Adam thinks about Adams thinks about this change because I, I thought I, I heard you say that you felt that it was within the spirit of what you were trying to do, just within the constraints that um, Solicitor Seawalt's working in. So it, is that do you do you still feel that way or do you feel like it's a significant That's enough right. change it, that you, it, so you're welcome to answer? Um, well, I, I, I mean, I characterize them as I characterize them two different way, I, I, two different ways, which I think what you're pointing out. Um, I, I think I said that he did intend to keep with the spirit of my events, and I believe that. And I also characterize them as as, as a major difference, um, as a major change. Um, frankly, after at this point, after this discussion, I'm I'm comfortable voting on it tonight, and I, and I, um, it, you know, I guess I guess everybody else is it major? I mean. Maybe, but I'm comfortable now. I mean, it's legal. I wish it came earlier. Um, I hope in the future that we do follow Rule 36. I think it's an important rule. But after this discussion, I'm comfortable with it. If that answers the question. Yeah, it does. I just wanted to make sure. Council Labarge. Yeah, I had great concerns of receiving the information um, about Councilor Adams being really upset about this being brought up in the fall. And I do recall that it was brought up in the fall. And plus the fact is, we were dealing with the public and we're still dealing with the public. To me, I think, Mayor, when do you have to have this approved by? Um, the city, uh, the, the um, finance director, uh, well. Well, she's, she's recognized, Susan. Susan. She's been recognized. Susan was covered in the blanket <laughs> recognition, okay. so. Uh, who's been so. As you know, the charter requires we give you the budget, the mayor present a budget to, by, I believe, mid-May. May 15th. May 15th. Um, right now, we're in the process of meeting with all the departments. We have yet to finalize the DPW budget because should you pass this enterprise fund, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change the general fund DPW budget greatly because right now the stormwater division is in the general fund. That's going to move into an enterprise fund. We're working on changing the indirects. Um, we're going to be changing how we account for people who work in multiple funds, like Jim Marilla, who works in the water fund, the sewer fund, et cetera. So it would, it would be very helpful to us if this could get voted by the end of March, which would give us April to kind of change the budget. Um, the DPW has a business uh, financial administrator. She's kind of holding off because the choice is either to develop two budgets on the, for the city and for the DPW and kind of have one set up go, to go one way and one to go the other way. But that, you know, can lead to mistakes at the, if you have to do it all very quickly at the last minute. So our preference would be if you could vote this before the end of March, it would give us April to pull it together. Thank you. As a city council, I, I have concerns here that we've had many, many hearings. We've been very transparent. 
and that's what the public wanted. They also wanted to have trust, and I think we gave them that. But I'm a little uncomfortable, and I have to agree with Councillor Klein of information coming in today. Yes, I just heard what had happened there. I just feel because of the letter that we received from Councillor Adams of his concerns of the public, okay, of them hearing about this cap for five years. My question to the council president, will there be a cap for five years? Because I have concerns that the public is being misled. Being misled because they were told there would be a cap for five years. And I've heard it from two employees from the Board of Public Works standing there and saying that. And we're the ones that are gonna have to deal with the public now to say. And I agree with you, Councillor Adams, on that email that we got, okay, that if this is not fair. So there will be a cap. Of, there will, uh, be, there a cap. will be a cap. There is, it's how, the, how that cap is described <coughs> is the question. And the cap, the, the Board of Public Works is charged with not exceeding the two million. for five years, two million dollars. Okay. And we always, retain the authority to hold them to that. Okay. So, but, and Councilor Adams would probably want to expand on this, but the fact is it's not as Councilor Adams had described in his, in, in his original language. And Councilor Adams, do you want to speak to that? I mean, that, that's right. Essentially, it's, it's, it's not, you know, there, there's a cap, but it's a, it's, a, it's a recommendation. It's not a mandate. So, so it is slightly different, but, Mine was not legal, so. Yes. <laughs> so. Part, of, part of the problem is that we cannot cap. We don't have the authority to cap because the so fact the is, is the executive body is in charge of determining budgets. We have the authority to reduce budgets, but and we also have the, we beyond our authority, we have influence, <coughs> but we do, we do not have the authority to literally restrict capital uh, uh, revenue limits and so what it is as Councillor Adams described is a very strong recommendation this is essentially think of it as a th sort of Damocles it is a threat that if you exceed two million dollars this council and possibly future councils will be prepared to cut that amount unless a good case is made in order to accommodate it and uh, and and I think that's another important point that was brought up that there may be circumstances that require going over that $2 million cap, in which case it is on this council to make its case and justify authorizing that if it were to be. So I, the, we're keeping within the, the framework of mass general law and the structure of our, our, our form of government, and, and that's what the solicitor's language change. I mean, the original <coughs> part of the discomfort that I think you're hearing from Councilor Klein and, and Councilor Adams was, the, and you're, as you've expressed too, the, the announcement or the, uh, or the revelation of this at this late hour. But I think what's more cogent at this point is do we disagree with that? If we think that the solicitor is in error, then that's what we should be debating. Um, we will have plenty of time to debate whether the solicitor wasn't, didn't do his job properly. But now we're debating whether we think Given the amount of information that we have available to us, if we believe that the solicitor, point of fact, is correct, and if he is, then I think it's appropriate for us to proceed. Yes. Councilor Barge. Yes, Councilor President. Um, I'm not saying that our city solicitor is incorrect. We hired him to represent us and the mayor. I agree with what he's saying. The problem I'm having is why wasn't this picked up way back? I mean, where you have engineers, knowledgeable people, and it's been sitting there about this capping. Why, why well, wasn't it? Picked I mean, up? I don't think we put the onus on the engineers. I mean, they've, they've, they well, they eat enough for a number of things. We don't need to do this because this is not their bailiwick. But and and the fact, and I think you're reaffirming what I just said. So if 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 um, we can, and I think it's not inappropriate to discuss the concerns that Councilor Adams have raised and you have raised, and Councilor Klein. 
But in the context of this debate, in the context of this document, I think we have to decide whether we believe, and you have acknowledged that you believe you. and it, that Counselor, uh, that Solicitor Seawald is correct, then I think we should proceed from there with that information and then deal and address with the other issues later because uh, Councilor Klein and then Councilor Carney. Thank you. But Councilor Klein, you're first. I just wanted to go on record as saying I wasn't uh, casting aspersions on Attorney Seawald's, uh, the city solicitor's uh, due diligence or anything like that. It was more a concern that it, it's just late mm -hmm. and we're kind of expected to synthesize this information very quickly. And I was also worried about kind of the rule 36, is it? Yes. Just the, whether we had in fact followed the kind of legal procedure that we need to follow in order to move an ordinance. So I just want to make that clear. So Councilor Klein's question is if, if, if we point in fact have violated rule 36, is that any decision rendered by this uh, council uh, valid? So am, am, I, am I restating that correctly? Thank you. So you, you want to address that point? Uh, I don't believe it does. I believe that uh, this body always retains the, uh, the, the authority and the power to um, amend or to, to uh, move to amend an ordinance when it gets to the floor of the council. And the rules are for our express purposes and they're not necessarily um, there are rules that we, for decorum and process, that we abide by. But the fact is, is it does not. It's not violation of charter. It's not violation of, right. of mass general law. Uh, Councilor Carney, and then Councilor Murphy. Okay. Um, thank you. I actually do appreciate um, your finding this before we had actually enacted something that may have been illegal, and um, then had had to really kind of backtrack or find some way to correct that problem. So while, uh, while we may argue that it's late, we're also, um, I'm also grateful that we're in time. We're in time that, because if I think if you hadn't gone that extra step looking at the, um, the amended, because this was an ordinance as amended right. out of the 20, uh, uh, February 25th meeting, to bring that to the DOR and look at those specifics and to do that in such a way that it did maintain the spirit of wanting to have some sense of a cap, but then put that onus back on this body, uh, on the mayor in this body in terms of being being able to do that. So I appreciate that. And also want to um, uh, underscore what the council president said is that we're going to be hearing another um, amendment that's coming to mm -hmm. us for the first time this after, I think only drafted this afternoon by a councillor. Morning. And many times councillors will, will draft up an amendment as we're sitting here or in the course of deliberation <laughs> based on thoughts that come up. So that's, uh, as Councillor Spector mentioned, that's why we have the two readings. We have a two week period then um, once we've voted on those things to be able to hear from constituents about what we've um, what we voted on and uh, rethink and be able to do that again in two weeks. So I'm comfortable with this process. This Council point. Murphy and then Councilor Spector. And this is pretty much just a quick reiteration, but you know what Councilor Sewell has told us is we can't preemptively by ordinance constrain the mayor's budgetary authority. So we can't cap him before he does his budget. But when he comes back here, we can cap him. Okay. You know, so we can't do it preemptively, but when he brings his budget here, we can say, no, nope, two million, that's it. We don't, we don't buy these other expenses. So it's just sort of moving it a little further down in the process. You know, but it's always our right to reduce the budget if we don't like it. So it, the authority really hasn't gone away. And as to Rule 36, I don't think we're ever going to constrain our right to make sausage the way we want to in council. I mean, we're always going to have the right to do that. So I'm not, I'm not really worried about that one. Councilor Specter. Yeah, I'll use the sausage, I guess, the, the sausage analogy because, I mean, there have only been a few times uh, in my 10 years as a councilor where I've seen something this big come through. So every once in a while, every few years, we have a pretty big ordinance. And I just want to make sure that everybody understands that and people at home, that we're talking about one piece of a very large ordinance. Um, and that every time that has happened, actually, did you talk to Councilor uh, Dwight earlier today? Because when we were having a discussion, he used the sausage term as well. And every time that's happened with one of these big ordinances, the same concerns have come up that you're expressing, and I understand. It seems like at the last moment. And part of that is 
these ordinances are so big and cover so much territory that every time it seems like, God, this is coming up the last minute. I remember turning to some counselor who did an amendment at last week. He said, where were you during the whole thing? And I realized it's a huge thing. And it comes to the floor. And there have often been amendments or changes to it at the last moment. And again, that's when I'm grateful that there's a, a second reading. But I've gone through, I, I remember being early on the first a big ordinance that came through having the same concerns. It's like, God, what, is this, isn't this all done now? Shouldn't we just be voting on everything that's done and put in place? And that's just not how it's made. So. Mm -hmm. um, Councilor. And if I may um, speak, speak to this side of the, to my right, I share your concern. I, I, I share your concern. I really wish that when this were just a five-year cap, when I saw this in September, it would have jumped out at me. But when it became a permanent cap, that's when it sort of the light went off and I said, wait a minute, this is a permanent cap so that 50 years from now we're still going to be charging, you know, we're still going to have 2 million plus whatever, you know, index for inflation there is? That, that just doesn't make sense because this sounds like a, a huge project and that's what piqued my interest and, and made me follow that path. Uh, I too wish that, that it had jumped, the five year cap had jumped out at me in September when I first looked at it, but it didn't. And um, um, so that's how we got here. Uh, Council LaBarge. Yes. I want to thank you, Attorney Seawald, for picking up what you found and hopefully we'll be able to move on. I, as a city councilor, I have a very large ward and I have people who have been watching this very, very carefully. And language is important and how it's communicated to the public. So I know I will get calls because I already know people are watching this tonight. And I have great concerns that it's coming, this fee is coming out of the taxpayers' pockets and that the communication is very, very thorough here on what is occurring with this whole ordinance. Um, and since we've um, discussed this one portion, I've had a request for a five minute break. I don't know if I'll get any objections to that, but the request is uh, not a debatable motion. Uh, Council Murphy. Oh, just, just, just a, a point of order. Um, when I moved it, I moved it with the changes from Attorney Seawall, right. and I think the second was with that. Yeah. So if we're taking a break, please think about are you comfortable with it as a composite ordinance with those changes? Because I think uh, Councilor O'Donnell is going to propose another change after this so if we're good to this point then we can deal right but and and so as now that we've dealt with the procedural issues and we've dealt with uh, the language we get to get to the meat and why before we get to the meat let's take a breath and take a break and we'll go into recess for you know seven minutes we'll reconvene in about seven minutes right here thank you very much also, can we skip the meat and do the tofu for a while? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was, that was <laughs> Welcome back. We're coming out of recess here for the council meeting uh, from a five minute recess that went to 12 minutes. So you have plenty of time to get your hot pockets out of the oven. Back to the hand here. Um, all right. The matter at hand. We're talking about the establishing an enterprise fund to address uh, stormwater and flood control. Um, and we've uh, now cleared up some language discussion, and I think it's appropriate to actually go point by point. Um, now, I'm not sure, does the council want to read through this all the way through? Have we had the head of the meeting? There's never been a public reading. Oh, then it's appropriate to. How many pages is it? Could, could you read it and the rest of us we could adjourn? go around? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's part of the reason you collect that enormous stipend is to sit here and listen to my presentation. Um, and in fact, actually, what I'd like to do is in pieces as we go. Great. So that if, if everyone's amenable, as we go from um, section to section. Is that agreeable to everyone? All right. Yes. In the City Council, uh, an ordinance amending the Code of Ordinances for the City of Northampton adopted, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton as follows. The Chapter 280 of the Code of Ordinances be, and is hereby amended by adding 
Stormwater and Flood Control Utility Ordinance, Section 280-1 through 280-12. And we'll start with Section 281, which is established. There is hereby established within the Department of Public Works a utility known as the Stormwater and Flood Control Utility under the day-to-day -day supervision of the Director of Public Works and the general supervision of the Board of Public Works. Any discussion? I will continue. Section 280-1, I mean 280-2, purpose. The stormwater and flood control utility shall administer the stormwater management and the flood control programs of the city. It shall be funded by revenue collected through the stormwater and flood control utility fee and such other funds as may, from time to time, be appropriated or obtained through grants and low interest loans. The stormwater management program is designed to promote the health and safety of the public, to protect the property, to protect property from flooding and the damage caused by stormwater runoff, and to protect and manage water quality by controlling the levels of pollutants in the stormwater runoff and the flow of water as conveyed by man-made and by natural stormwater management systems and facilities, whether publicly or privately owned. The flood control program is designed to maintain, operate, modify, construct, or replace flood control systems in the city that protect the city from flooding from the Mill River and the Connecticut River systems. Uh, section. Yes. Oh, yes. I do have Council Inspector. I'm not sure. You, but since the word fee is in here, it's the first time we've seen it. I, I'd like to make a comment about that. Please. So, um, because earlier in this evening, a member of the um, Stormwater Task Force spoke, and he talked about the, the the two fee structures that the task force talked about, and he kind of implied that they, you know, that there wasn't a lot of discussion on that. I, I just want to disagree, and you can go back to the report and see that there was quite a lot of discussion about which fee it should be, and that the task force actually did take a vote on which fee it should be and make a recommend, and in that they were essentially making a recommendation. They chose to move forward to be as transparent as possible and say, okay, we had the discussion. They chose to then, in the report, include both fee structures, but I believe, I tried to go back and look I believe the vote was two to one I think it was like eight to four so the a good solid majority of that committee after quite a bit of discussion on those structures chose one of those fee structures and uh, they just wanted to clear that up and and one of the things that the committee that the task force was charged with was to say how should we pay for this and so there this could have been done out of the general fund this could have been done through a bonding issue it could be done through a fee. The reason a fee was chosen primarily was so that it was fair that everybody who, you, who contributes to the, the, the problem of, of maintaining this should pay for it. And if we did it either through the general fund, general taxation, or through a capital bonding issue, in those two cases, nonprofits, say Smith College or the hospital or other entities like that, would not be paying their share of this. And that only left, as one reason to do this, the option of making this a fee. And so when it's a fee, we are all in this together. Anyone want to add to that? Uh, I'm not regarding the fee, and I hope it doesn't digress too much, but um, I just wanted to point out, because we haven't had a lot of discussion about the need, even though we did this in mm -hmm. many uh, community meetings across the city. Um, but I, I've just, in, in the context of this whole discussion of stormwater and floods in general, been really thinking about the history and the number of floods that we've had. Where most most of us think about you know, the major Connecticut River flooding and the 1938 hurricane and those things. But there is a reference in our ordinance to the Mill River flood too. And I want to remind people, and this came out of my reading of the 350th history mm. of the city of Northampton, a great piece that's written in there about the famous flood of 1874. And I hope people will tolerate me just reading this one paragraph, not from that book, but just to understand the gravity of, of the situation and what could happen should the Mill River flood. So in this case in 1874, villagers had no warning except for the shouts of four brave men. First was alerted by the dam keeper who relayed the message from the valley to racing ahead of the flood in wagons and on horseback to alarm the factories first and then villagers at home. Most of the factory workers escaped and the majority of the dead were women, children, and older people at home eating breakfast or doing morning chores. 
Half of the victims were immigrants, mostly from Canada and Ireland. Within an hour of the dam break, 139 were dead, 740 were homeless in the villages of Williamsburg, Skinnerville, and Haydenville in the town of Williamsburg and Leeds in the town of Northampton were washed away. One million dollars in property, and this is 1874, was destroyed. Most of it, the value of the factories owned by reservoir company members, all uninsured. Just a small digression to emphasize why it's so important for us to be passing this. Thank you for the Sections 1 through 24 of Chapter 83 of the Mass General Laws of the Commonwealth and uh, such other powers as granted to cities in the same general law. Um, section 280 4, definition. Uh, the following words, terms, and phrases, when used in this article, shall have the meaning ascribed to them in this section, except for where the context clearly indicates a different meaning. Um, Credit means a reduction in the amount of stormwater and flood control utility fee charged to a particular property. I'm still not working. Oh. Okay. Oh, Stereo. <laughs> Direct costs shall mean direct costs shall mean the costs incurred in the operation and maintenance of the stormwater and flood control system as reflected in the stormwater and flood control enterprise fund budget. Drainage system shall mean natural and man-made channels, swales, ditches, swamps, rivers, streams, brooks, creeks, wetlands, branches, reservoirs, ponds, drainage ways, drainage structures, conveyances, storm drains, catch basins, inlets, gutters, pipes, culverts, bridges, head walls, storm sewers, lakes, and other physical works, properties and improvements that collect, transport, transfer, control, pump, treat, convey, dispose of, or otherwise influence the, mo the movement of stormwater runoff. A dwelling unit means the individual private premises contained in any building intended, whether occupied or not, as the residence for one household, regardless of the number of individuals in the household. A building may contain more than one dwelling unit. Flood control, uh, flood control system shall mean man-made levees, flood walls, pump stations, stop log structures, and other flood protection improvements. General laws means the general laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. <coughs> Hydraulic acreage, and this is particularly important, is the sum of the impervious and pervious areas as modified by runoff coefficients, and we'll speak more about that, I think. And if you've had the pleasure of listening to Terry, you and, and you can call up Terry at his home anytime. <laughs> we'll, we'll run the number right below here, and you can call him up anytime to ask him what the hell the coefficients are. We are actually pretty well versed in that. So, impervious surface means those areas which prevent or impede the infiltration of stormwater into the soil in the manner in which it entered the soil in natural conditions prior to development. Common impervious surfaces include, but are not limited to, rooftops, buildings, or structures, sidewalks, walkways, patio areas, decks, driveways, parking lots, storage areas, compacted gravel and soil surfaces, awnings, and other fabric or plastic coverings, and other surfaces which prevent or impede the natural infiltration of stormwater runoff, which existed prior to development. And here is another place where we have um, uh, have uh, a change directed by uh, Solicitor Seawall. Indirect costs shall mean the costs incurred in the operation and maintenance of the stormwater and flood control system appropriated as part of the general fund operating budget and allocated to the stormwater and flood control enterprise fund budget. An example of an indirect cost would be the value of time spent by the general fund employees in the collector's office processing enterprise fund user payments. Uh, large residential property means improved property containing apartments or condominiums um, with four or more 
uh, actually, is it now greater or is it greater? More? Was it's now more with four or more dwelling units and rooming and boarding houses. Large residential properties shall not include improved property containing structures used primarily for non residential purposes, i.e., hotels, retirement centers, nursing homes, or assisted living homes, or properties designated as mixed use properties by the Board of Advisors. <coughs> Non-residential property means property that is not residential property is defined herein including, but not limited to such property as commercial and office buildings, public buildings and structures, industrial and manufacturing buildings, storage buildings, storage areas, parking lots, roadways, driveways, parks, recreation properties, tennis courts, swimming pools, public and private schools and universities, research facilities and stations, hospitals and convalescent centers, airports, agricultural uses, water and wastewater treatment plants, hotels, motels, retirement centers, nursing homes, or assisted living homes, properties designated as mixed use properties by the Board of Assessors, and any other form of use not otherwise mentioned, which is not a residential property. Pervious surface, another important definition, means those areas that allow the unimpeded infiltration of stormwater into the soil. Common pervious, pervious surfaces include, but are not limited to, lawn area, forest land, agricultural lands, meadows, and other undeveloped land. In determining the utility fee cal calculations, all land on a parcel of property not defined as impervious land will be considered to be pervious. The runoff coefficient means a factor that is used to estimate the percentage of precipitation that results in the surface water runoff. Runoff coefficients are values between 0 and 1, commonly used in stormwater runoff calculations, as part of a standard engineering methodologies and practices. Runoff coefficients are used as a means to approximate a property's impact on the city's stormwater and flood control systems. Small residential property means improved property containing one, two, or three dwelling units. Small residential properties shall not include improved property containing structures used primarily for non-residential purposes, i.e. hotels, motels, retirement centers, nursing homes, or assisted living homes, or properties designated as mixed-use properties by the Board of Assessors. Stormwater shall mean the surface water runoff from precipitation. Stormwater management and flood control services mean all services provided by the city which relate to a transfer control conveyance treatment or movement of stormwater runoff through the through the city b maintenance repair and replacement of existing stormwater management and flood control systems c planning development uh, design and construction of additional stormwater management and flood control systems and facilities to meet and, uh, current and anticipated needs d regulations of the use of stormwater management services systems and facilities and e compliance with applicable code state and federal stormwater management and flood control regulations permit requirements and mandates stormwater management services may uh, address the quality of stormwater runoff as well as the quantity thereof stormwater management systems and facilities shall mean those natural and man-made channels, soils, ditches, rivers, streams, brooks, creeks, wetlands, branches, reservoirs, ponds, drainage ways, drainage structures, conveyance, storms, drains, catch basins, inlets, gutters, pipes, culverts, bridges, headwalls, storm sewers, lakes, <laughs> thank you, and other physical works, properties, and improvements that collect, transport, transfer, control, pump, treat, convey, contain, <laughs> retain, dispose of, or otherwise influence the movement of stormwater runoff. Can I, in <laughs> for one sec? Sure. Give you a breather. Um, I've had a request that we put this up on the screen. Is that possible, Mary? She doesn't have it to put on the screen. Um, um, if I email it to you, I can't get the. Yeah. She has to do it off the thumb drive. So. It's also if you're watching at home, the, uh, this is available on the city website, uh, not including the modifications. Um, but it is available if you want to read along at home. Um, okay. Uh, the stormwater and flood control utility fee means the periodic user fee imposed pursuant to this ordinance by the City of Northampton for providing stormwater management and flood control services. And undeveloped land shall mean all land that is not altered from its natural state. Now, um, are there any 
questions or discussion on the definitions. Section 280-5, this is stormwater and flood control utility fee established. That's quarterly billing, deposit to special revenue account. A, pursuant to Section 16 of Chapter 83 of the General Laws, the City hereby establishes a charge for the use of the stormwater management and flood control services of the City to be known as the stormwater and flood control utility fee. B, the stormwater and flood control utility fee is imposed on each parcel of residential property and each parcel of non-residential property, whether occupied or not. And the fees shall be billed in advance on a quarterly basis to the record title <coughs> to the record title owner of the property. <coughs> the quarterly billing shall be consolidated in the same bill as is sent to the said property owner for other services provided by the city supported by fees, including water service and sanitary sewer use. If the property does not receive a water uh, slash sewer bill from the city, a bill for only the stormwater and flood control fee will be sent. C. Receipts generated from the stormwater and flood control utility fee shall be deposited to a special revenue account to be known as the stormwater management and flood control account set up in accordance with the authority granted by section um, 53E, right? F, F, it, F. it is F and a half. Okay. <laughs> it's, not, it's okay. F and a half of Chapter 44 of the General Laws and the funds deposited to this account shall be used to fund stormwater management and flood control program of the city. Two, uh, 280-6, the rates. The Board of Public Works shall recommend an annual budget for stormwater management and flood control services to the mayor. The mayor shall include a proposed annual budget for the stormwater management and flood control services in the proposed operating budget submitted to the City Council in accordance with Section 7-3 of the Charter of the City of Northampton. The budget submitted by the Mayor and approved by the City Council shall set the annual budget at an amount that will be sufficient to provide for a balanced operating and capital improvement budget for the stormwater management and flood control services. B. For the first five fiscal years of the utility operation, the Board of Public Works shall recommend a budget for each year with revenue raised by the utility that shall not exceed $2 million per year, okay. unless the Board shall state with specificity the reasons for its recommendation of a budget with revenue in excess of $2 million. C. Beginning in the sixth year, the Board of Public Works shall recommend a budget for each year with revenue raised by the utility that shall not exceed $2 million plus the cost of inflation as determined by the $2 million per year plus the cost of inflation as the, I'm sorry, I'm repeating, as determined by the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics Consumer Price Index, and unless the Board shall state with specificity the reasons for its recommendations of a budget with revenue in excess of the limitations set forth in this subsection. Any further discussion on this? Uh, that is actually, that's the that's proposed, the that's, 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 that's it. That that's the amended language. That's the amended that's language, but that's. It does it have a typo, or is it just that I read it twice? No, I think you read it right. Did it? Okay. All right. I'll accept the Scribner's uh, adjustment for deleting the line that I did, in fact, read twice. Oh, good. At least I wasn't hallucinating. I thought maybe I had a stroke. And we, uh, um, so the line is. Um, well, one line you have the number two, and the other you have the word TWO. Uh, $2 million plus the cost of inflation is determined by the $2 million plus the cost. Let's go with the uh, written out $2 million per year and delete um, the one Numeric starting at the numerical $2 million plus the cost of. Can you see that, Mary, in the second mm -hmm. line? Mm -hmm. So it now reads, shall not exceed uh, inflation as determined by the $2 million per year. I actually, yeah. Well, if you're going to spell out the $2 million, you should do it all four times. Yeah. So the actual point. So for every, every point that you see where it says numerical $2 million, it should be adjusted to be TWO. Um, and then delete the language so that it, it, it eliminates the redundancy. Okay. Is everyone okay with that as a Scribner's yes. adjustment? D, the rate model for billing. And here's where we get to it. 
uh, shall be based on a the impervious surface area on a parcel multiplied by a runoff coefficient of 0 0.95 b the pervious area on a parcel multiplied by a runoff coefficient of 0 0.1 the maximum billable per pervious area for any one property shall be one acre c the sum of the impervious and pervious areas modified by the runoff coefficients described above is the hydraulic acreage for each parcel. Um, so I'm going to ask if there are any questions on this point. Now, built into this, it should be noted about the one acre and Councilor Specter. Again, if uh, folks watching at home, if you go to the city website, the report by the task force, the stormwater task force, you'll see the link to it. And you'll see the discussion, rather lengthy discussion, about which of the fee structures would work better. And it's written up there. Um, if folks want, I think it could probably be explained pretty easily by, by Terry. Um, but if not, if we want to move on, that's fine. I mean, this was the fee structure that a majority of the task force recommended. If it's my, that's my understanding. Is that correct? Uh, Councilor Shara and then Councilor Labarge. Um, I, I've heard the reasoning for um, for the one acre, but perhaps it would be worthwhile having it stated again just for uh, Jim or Terry. Do you want to come up and better. speak to the the one acre limitation of pervious land? The best proxy we had for determining the impact of any given property toward the overall stormwater runoff in the city was the size of the property. Uh, so the, the most simple model would be simply to divide the entire number of square feet in the city by the fee we wanted to raise, and we would have the cost per square foot. We look at a particular property, how many square feet, do the math, there's the bill. The problem we had with that, we realized immediately, even with just a cursory look, is that it shifted almost all of the fee into the outskirts of the city, mm -hmm. the farmland, forest land, open land, land that we actually value, land which is in fact, from a stormwater perspective, desirable land. So the next step is to, in a sense, look at the calculation. How can we adjust the calculation so that it's fair and so that it doesn't shift an unwarranted burden onto land that we are actually considering to be desirable. Um, the 0.95 for impervious surface is pretty straightforward. Maybe not 100% of the rain that falls on that surface runs off, but say 95% of it runs off. For pervious surface, we begin by saying 10% of the water runs off. And then to avoid penalizing open land, we cap the amount of land that would be billed at one acre. The, f the final piece is you look at the resulting bills and they, they looked fair, they looked reasonable, uh, they seemed to make sense. So that one acre cap was, pr was suggested at the task force level and it's been moving forward ever since at that one acre. To repeat myself just briefly, it seems to create a bill structure that seems reasonable, fair, and makes sense. Council Labar. So I know with the meetings that I attended, we looked at small homes, mm -hmm. less than 2,000 square feet impervious, which was what, $61 or? Approximately. About that? Yes. Would that be a definite? Because these figures have been brought out several times. So I know when I called Jim Larillo last week to talk with him about this, because what so we were hearing was mm -hmm. about the 2,000 square feet at 61 and 2,000, 4,000 square feet at 97. Is this a definite? Or will there be some changes? There will be some changes. The, the original uh, aerial surveys we had were not as crisp so that you could see the corners of the house and the, the bay window. Uh, actually, the, it more looked like a blob the impervious surface on the larger property from the aerial survey looks like a blob of impervious. We're paying Camp Dresser and McKee at this moment 
to go through all 9,200 properties in the city, opening up the files one property at a time, going through every single property, cleaning up the data, improving the accuracy of the data. Uh, we have received back about 25% of the total number of properties from them, at least with a preliminary look, and it looks like the numbers are staying to within two or three percent of what we had anticipated. We're looking at, Terry, also what, 6,600 homes? 6,600 properties are classified under that small residential mm -hmm. category. Right. Turn me off if I'm going too, into too much detail here, but originally when we looked at them, 2,000 square feet or less, 4,000 square feet or more, seemed to give a very even distribution between small, medium, and large. It looked like a bell curve. As we're getting more information back from CDM, it's clear that that 2,000 square foot breakpoint isn't working out as neatly as we had hoped. Uh, we have proposed at the Ordinance Committee that instead of trying to codify a particular number of square feet, instead we say, look, we're going to split it up so that 25% are classified as small, 50% is medium, 25% is large. Uh, okay, so at the medium, we're going through the tiers again, mm -hmm. which was the 2,000 to 4,000 square feet right. at $97. Correct. Right. So the large ones, homes, over 4,000 square feet in Paris was what? About 233. So that, you know, that, that might vary five, six, seven dollars okay. based on what we're seeing so far from CDM. It should also be noted that any credits or abatements that you are discussing will impact the final the final fee because whatever adjustments that we make in that level have to be borne by um, being redistributed so. Thank you. <clears throat> um, the uh, we're up to e a billing rate for a square foot of hydraulic acreage will be calculated by the Department of Public Works as Terry mentioned and approved by the Board of Public Works each year by dividing the approved annual budget as described above by the total hydraulic acreage to be billed in the city of Northampton. The rate shall be on file in the office of the Department of Public Works of the city of Northampton. F, and here's where I expect that we'll probably hear from Councilor O'Donnell, but as it reads now, small residential property shall be divided into three groups based on the amount of impervious area. These groups shall be sized such that, and this is again as Terry described, A, 25% of the properties will be in the smallest category. And as he pointed out, this used to actually stipulate square footage, but now it's more dispersed um, more generically. Uh, B, 50% of the properties will be in the middle of the category, and C, 25% of the properties shall be in the largest category. All properties within each group shall receive the same bill. The bill for each group shall be calculated based on the average impervious and impervious areas of the properties that fall within each group. And the Board of Public Works shall determine the range of impervious area used for defining each group. Am I really becoming that predictable well, already? <laughs> I was trying to catch everyone off guard with that. <laughs> um, I, I would like to suggest an amendment to um, this section. And um, you, you have it printed out in your packets along with some data that was very helpfully gathered by uh, the Department of Public Works. And special thanks to uh, Mr. Larla for, for putting all that together um, so we can, as a council, consider this um, with actual data. Um, before I explain the uh, uh, amendment itself, I'd like to just kind of introduce it by saying this was an idea that came up in, in the ordinance hearing last Tuesday. Uh, I'm guilty of the one who brought, of being the one who brought it up at that time. And when uh, I, I did, I, I sensed there was some interest in discussing it. So that's the reason why I wrote this amendment to bring to the full council tonight. Um, I don't offer it in the spirit of this must be passed or else we have a flawed ordinance. Not in any way. This, it, it represents a policy option that I think will be great for the council to consider. So this is what the amendment does. Um, as Council President just, just explained, right now. Does it need to be offered and then seconded at this oh, point? Oh, yeah. Well, discuss? 
Second. If you might want to second it before he puts on the floor. Okay. okay. So, Thank you. Floor. so now I'm so on the floor. Yeah, the, the amendment. Thank you. Usually we get the de amendment defined before we, we move it, but that's fine. You go right ahead. Okay. Thank you. So right now the ordinance establishes three tiers um, array of small residential properties, of which there are about 6,600 in the city. Uh, and the tiers are correlate to size, the amount of impervious surface you have. There is the lower 25% of the smallest properties. There is a middle 50% of medium properties and a 25% uh, a at the very top of the largest properties. Um, this amendment would simply split the middle 50% so that we wind up with not three but four properties. Uh, it would not change the total amount of money raised through fees in this category of, of property it would change the distribution of it in the middle. Um, the, the virtue of, of what we have now in the ordinance, it's in other words, the virtue of not passing this, I think, is that you do have, if you look at the rates, and I'll, I'll read the rates again just so they're fresh in everyone's mind. Um, currently, the lower 25 is, is predicted to have a bill of $61.00. The middle 50 is predicted to have a bill of $99, and the top 25 is predicted to have a bill of $239. Um, there's a virtue there of having three quarters of all properties pay under $100. Um, it's sort of a magic number. I mean, $100 sounds good. Um, that will change, though, as, has been, as it's been noted. You know, once we start using credits and this kind of thing, that those numbers will, will change around a little bit. Um, so that benefit won't last forever. But the disadvantage of it is if you look at the middle 50%, um, if you're at the lower end of that middle 50%, you can make an argument that you're paying too much and that you are, in fact, in a way, subsidizing what uh, the lower amount that people on the upper end of the 50% are paying. So if you split that in two and set up, and set up four tiers, you are closer to an ideal of, of a more progressive curve. Um, with all the hearings we had throughout the city, and I, I went to many of them, as I know um, many of you did as well, the thing that I heard was that people don't want to pay for impervious surface they don't have. So the intention behind this amendment is to more closely correlate your surface with your bill. And that's what it does. Okay. But again, I offer it for discussion. Um, can we have Mr. Colleen? Weighing in on this one, I know that you said that they analyzed it, so <coughs> Mr. Klein could come up and just tell great. us what he sees of the impact of this and how DPW can accommodate that. From our perspective, it's purely a, a policy issue. It has, it's revenue neutral. It has no impact on the overall portion of the fee paid by residential properties. It has no impact on the gross size of the fee. Uh, it has the advantage, as Ron has pointed out, that it's somewhat more fair to the people at the smaller end of that middle spectrum. Um, but it's completely neutral from our perspective. So no budget implications whatsoever. Okay. Yeah. Councilor Spector. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I heard the same thing as, uh, as the council presenting the amendment. And I think this makes it a little fairer. I mean, the question that I to go back to the counselor explained the math on this. Well, if we can do four, and we'd heard you could, why not do five? Why not do seven? Why not just do 6,320? Well, you can't do that. But if we start getting up, and, and you may want to explain the math again, or you may not. I did understand it when you said it, but I couldn't explain it to someone else. Is that the reason, once you leave that four area, if I understand correctly, that you actually start getting areas in that that become unfair in, in a certain way? And so I'm glad it can be at four. I appreciate the work you've done. I think it does address concerns that I heard at a number of the meetings that, hey, it breaks it up into at least smaller. The, the, the best way to break this up is in four ways so that people will pay what they feel they should be paying. And it, it makes the categories a little fairer. Uh, and Councilor Barge, I'll get to you in a second, but if, if uh, the one thing you missed, Councilor O'Donnell, was explaining what the price breakdown would be in the four turn. Right. Years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, because we're only changing, and this gets to Councillor Spector's question a little bit as well, because we're only changing the middle 50, we leave the bottom 25 and the top 25 alone. Those stay the same. 
Um, so what you do is you take the middle 50, which has a bill of $99 right now, a projected bill. And that, that's an average for the whole 50. So you, you would undo the average. And suddenly the lower half is going to pay a little less. The top half is going to pay a little more. So the Board of Public Works has, the Department of Public Works has predicted the lower half of that middle would drop from 99 to $85. So $14 less per year. Again, that affects approximately 1,650 properties in the city. Um, the next 1,650 properties will go up by the same amount, but it's because they have more impervious surface. So that's the, that, that's the change in the fees. So and the tier would read $61 for tier one, $85, and again, these are not precise numbers, uh, $85 for tier two, uh, tier three would be $113, and tier four would be $239. Yes. Councilor um, O'Donnell, on the tier one, is it the same as small houses, 2,000 square feet? Under Impervious, is that what we're talking about? And are we also talking about the medium? Is that tier two that you're looking at? At the $99 to 85? Explain, really, you need to explain this to me. Certainly, may. Yeah, please, the okay. question was directed to you. Um, if you're comparing what's currently written in the ordinance, and right. I, I, I reprinted something that the Department of Public Works has made available to us, which is... I saw that. Okay. So if you look at it, you'll see that um, the bottom tier is defined as small residential properties of less than 2,020 square feet of impervious area. If this amendment were adopted, that would remain the same the amount of impervious area and correspondingly the bill. And what's tier four? Tier four will remain the same as well. That's the what highest. What is it? 4,100 square feet or greater. 4,000 or <coughs> That's right. And, and so then I think to answer your question fully, the middle tier is now being split into two. So currently, if you look at the chart, you, you call that tier two. After the amendments, if the amendment were adopted, Tier two would become tier two and three, and um, there would be two different fees depending on where you f where you fell in that large middle fifty percent. Okay, so Jim Larillo apparently spent time with you of going over this amendment that you wanted to add on. Correct. Correct. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, j just a moment, uh, for point of clarification, uh, Jim or Terry, the. Um, the delineation that you made based on square footage now you're kind of, you're actually talking about getting rid of that and actually just doing it quantitatively right do you want to you want to explain what your I, mean, I remember Terry talking about that in the ordinance that well um, for the purposes of discussion for for uh, councillor O'Donnell's proposal we use the data that's available so we're talking about numbers that are preliminary so the actual square footages would vary um, as Councillor O'Donnell has a, a clearly articulated, I think, um, the tiers as defined were based on the data that we have and the lower and the upper tiers for each, each of the three or four tier options would be the same. Um, but it would be based on the percentage of households that would fall um, within the 20, 20, 20, or 25, 25, 25, 25 for the four tier um, option, if that makes sense. Am I making it clear? He, well, so he did such a nice job. I hope I'm not money. You know. Well, but, but basically, this criteria by which we've been uh, somewhat relying on is the 20,020 20 square feet um, <coughs> cutoff point uh, of to 4,100. That is adjusted, but principally because these property sizes w are variable also over the course of time. And that so what it's broken down into quarters now, or what's being proposed, broken down into quarters is small, medium, medium, large, and large, right? right. And so it's it's like your offering of a bente, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's your Starbucks coffee option as opposed to actually defining the size, which Starbucks will also do. They'll adjust the size accordingly. <laughs> they need to make more money, but that is correct. 
Okay. The Starbucks analogy <laughs> is accurate. Uh, Councilor Shira, you had a question, and I, and I. Oh, I think I was just going to ask Councilor O'Donnell if if that third tier was going to be roughly three thousand square feet, but it sounds like we're that's sort of what we're discussing. Um, the the third tier, as predicted by um, the Department of Public Works, would would be approximately um, twenty eight hundred feet to forty one hundred feet. Does that mm -hmm. answer your question? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, essentially, approximately that. Councilor Carn. Um, uh, thank you, Councilor Dunn, for putting this together. This actually came up at the ordinance committee meeting, a more matter of conjecture at the time. But if we noted that pre the originally proposed three tiers weren't of the same size, there was the first and the third were both 25 percent, but there was a big middle. So it just made sense to kind of make them four even sizes, and that would then um, correct the you know the presumption that somebody, as we as councilor noted, on the bottom end of a large category wouldn't be saying that paying the same amount of money as somebody at the top end of another large of the same large category. Small money, but really yes. Any other discussion on the amendment? Uh, I'm going to ask a roll call for the amendment, please. Well, it was moved with the city solicitor's <coughs> amendment. This is the motion that we're discussing with those recommendations in tax so the so first you want this roll call and then later we're going to this this roll call will have the roll call on the final motion the motion was made on the attorney uh, the solicitor's um recommend uh, uh his recommended amendment so that's in fact actually voting on the amended okay. language so if, that, if this passed it would be added to that this would okay. be added to that okay. correct so, um, Council yes Council Murphy? yes Councilor Yes. Councilor Sheriff? Yes. Councilor Specter? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Fine? Yes. Thank you. That was, um, okay. This is now up to G. Bills for a large residential property and non-residential property shall be determined based on estimated areas and pervious and pervious surface on the property. Property owners who own multiple under, uh, undeveloped parcels with protected status, protected for open space by fee or less than fee ownership by methods, including but not limited to Mass uh, Constitution 97th Article of Amendment, Mass General Law, Chapter 8C, Mass General Law, Chapter 44B, Mass General Law, Chapter 45, Mass General Law, Chapter 61, Chapter 61A, Chapter 61B, Chapter uh, 184, or held by a nonprofit land trust shall be assessed as if their multiple parcels were all part of a single larger parcel. Um, any discussion on that point? Okay. Uh, H, after calculating the billing rate per square foot of hydraulic acreage in the subsection D, the Board of Public Works will establish a standardized fee for each of the three classes of small residential properties, the now four classes, four classes. that should be amended to say four classes, of small residential properties in accord with subsection C. I, any impervious areas within the federal, state, county, and city-owned right-of-way used by the traveling public will not be attributed to the parcel and will not be considered as part of the total impervious area of that parcel. Any questions? Discussion. Section 280-7, the scope of responsibility for stormwater management and flood control systems and facilities. The city shall be responsible for all costs to operate, maintain, and improve, and access, uh, assess the stormwater management and flood control systems and facilities which are located, one, within the public road rights of way, two, on private property, but within easements granted to and accepted by the city of Northampton or otherwise permitted to be located on such private property by the written agreements for rights of entry, rights of access, rights of use, 
or such other lawful means to allow for operation, maintenance, improvement, and uh, access to the stormwater management system facilities located thereon. And three, on public land, which is owned by the city and or land of another governmental entity upon which the city has agreements providing for the operation, maintenance, improvement, and access to the stormwater management and flood control systems and facilities located thereon. B, operation, maintenance, and or improvement of stormwater management and flood control systems and facilities which are located on a private or public property are not owned by the city and for which the city lacks a lawful right of entry shall be and remain the legal responsibility of the property owner except as otherwise provided for by the state and federal laws and regulations. And that's um, the clarification that the solicitor had made uh, upon the recommendation of the engineers. Section 280-8 purposes of the fund. This is crackling, right? <laughs> the stormwater and flood control utility fee shall only be used for the district and indirect costs of the utility to provide stormwater management and flood control services as defined in section 280-4 and also includes the following a the acquisition by gift purchase or co uh, condemnation of real and personal property and interests therein necessary to construct operate and maintain stormwater management and flood control systems and facilities <coughs> b all costs of administration and implementations implementation of the stormwater management and flood control programs including the cost of labor attributable to the stormwater management and flood control programs and the establishment of reasonable operating capital reserves to meet unanticipated or emergency stormwater management and flood control requirements c engineering and design debt service and related financing expenses construction costs for new facilities and enlargement or improvement of existing facilities d operation and maintenance of the stormwater and flood control systems e capital projects for stormwater management and flood control f illicit discharge detection and elimination uh, g monitoring surveillance and inspection of stormwater control devices h uh, water quality monitoring and water quality programs i retrofitting developed areas for pollution control j inspection and enforcement activities k billing and related administrative costs i other activities which are reasonable uh, it's reasonably l. It's an l l i'm sorry thank you l other activities which are reasonably necessary including costs related to regulatory compliance and as you know uh councilor adams has withdrawn his proposal for m any discussion on this uh, section 280-9 stormwater and flood control utility fee for uh, exemptions and there should be some conversation associated with this a the city finds that all real property in the city contributes to runoff and either uses or benefits from the maintenance of stormwater of the stormwater system therefore except as provided in this section or otherwise provided by law no public or private property located in the city of Northampton shall be exempt from the stormwater and flood control utility fee charges b notwithstanding the foregoing the city established exemptions to the stormwater and flood control utility fee as follows one public streets highways and rights of way however maintenance buildings and or other improved property used for road maintenance purposes shall not be exempt from the stormwater and flood control utility fee all other state and federal and county properties are subject to the user fees charges on the same uh, basis as private properties. Uh, Councilor Carney. Okay. Um, well, I support the language. Um, I think there's been cer certainly a lot of talk about why um, why it's fair that uh, city property be um, not exempt uh, nor any other private or nonprofit property and I think that um, there's been a lot of talk about why um, the city should also pay in the same way that everyone else pays for example but I, I, it was important I, th I think to underscore what that means in terms of the burden to the taxpayer that we shouldn't fool ourselves we should really understand that 
when we say uh, public property, what we mean is no public or private property, no public property, including all taxpayer funded property in the city of Northampton or pro private property. So people should understand that they are paying an assessment on the property that they own, their own home. And they're also paying by virtue of being taxpayers and funders of all that city property that is in the city. So um, it's just, I, I just think it's really important. I don't, I'm not really, I'm not sure that it warrants changing any language in here for that, but I think it's important that we stress the taxpayers are paying on their own property and by virtue of being the taxpayers, the, 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 uh, those that pay the taxes that fund all of the city owned property, they're paying on that as well. Exactly. So I, I just think it's important to note that. I don't know that it's important to specify it, write it out in the in the language, but I, I think it should be clear. I think I agree with Councilor Carney on this. And the reason it's not that, that big a thing, it's not a we're talking about actually a very small amount when we divide it up among the taxpayers. So it's it may come down to the principle of the thing. Because I think the figure that's been thrown out is the city would pay approximately $175,000. Is that correct? Yeah. So we take $175,000 and divide among all of the other property owners in the, in the city, it came out to like $8.10, that essentially the taxpayer is paying. If we didn't have it, if the city did not pay this, that $175,000 would be distributed among all of the same people, those homeowners, all the commercial owners and the nonprofits. And I believe the difference then of the 10 percent, we're talking about a very small difference if the city either pays it, we, we pay it through that way, or we pay it the other way. If we pay it, if the city does not pay, I think individual homeowners will save a tiny bit of money each year. Um, but it is, it is a very small amount either way. And so really, we, the argument would really be primarily about the principle of doing this. And I agree with you. Let's not kid ourselves. The city is us. So when we say the city will pay for it, so that we're saying, yeah, we may feel good. Well, the city's going to pay for their, their share of it. Well, that's us. So we're paying the share. And we can decide whether we want to do that as a city or not. It should also be noted that the Chamber of Commerce advanced that, that, that there will be a savings that will be realized in the general fund um, of close to $300,000 that will now be borne by this established fund. Important fact, actually, the city's a safe. If you if you subtract out that one hundred and seventy-five thousand dollar commitment, the city's got a, a buck and a quarter, one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. So, in in that sense, I mean, I think it's very important to be clear about the language. And I don't. Uh, and 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 as you point out, the results will ultimately be the same. These the systems will be subsidized. But uh, point in fact, actually, a slightly greater burden will be adjusted for taxpayers. And one of the things that we carried the banner on in this one was that the one ideal thing about the fee is that the fee actually allows us to charge fairly um, uh, nonprofits that do not have to pay taxes, do not have to pay property taxes, and also are major contributors, as you'll, if you look at that list, are major contributors to the stormwater run of, of impervious area. So as we had this discussion, it always felt slightly disingenuous. And particularly when people started saying, well, it's good that the city carry their share. And these were citizens. And I said just exactly what you said. Well, let's just remember, you're saying you, we, we are the city. It's not the city is not some privately subsidized entity that's just, you know, living off the people here. This is, it is, these, you will be paying for that. Uh, and you're right, it's, it, in, when spread out, it will be a negligible difference, but at the same time, there is, there, I think, there is a whiff of disingenuousness, and I'm glad that Councilor Carney and, and Councilor Specker made a point of pointing that out. Uh, uh, Councilor Murphy. To the, uh, to the same point, the entire burden is now on the general. You know, it's, it's all on, on the property taxpayers now. So I think you'll find that uh, when you look at $175,000 that will gener be generated by city fees under the fund, it's considerably more than that now. So actually we'll be backing quite a bit out of general fund support. Um, 
So we should not we should not miss that. You know, we're paying some, but we're paying less under this than we're paying today. Uh, any other discussion on this point? You're not proposing an amendment. I haven't I haven't written up any amended language. I, th I just thought it was important to at least have it stated. Um, I don't know if someone else can offer something that would say that in the amendment. I don't. I mean, in the in the ordinance itself. Um, well, I'm, I'd, I'd like to hear it, but I wasn't sure how to wear that. You suggested just a question of uh, a, a couple of word changes indicating that this property. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I could offer I could offer something that would say um, in the second section. Therefore, except as provided in this section or otherwise provided by law, no public property funded by taxpayers of the city of Northampton nor any private property located in the city of Northampton shall be exempt from stormwater and flood control utility fee charges. I, the only, my only concern with, fun, with wording it that way is I want to make it, it I, I think we need to say no public property, including all pro public property funded by, so that we don't rule out any public property that somehow may not be funded by Northampton taxpayers. So I, I hate to confuse you, Mary, and I'm sorry I haven't written this out, but I'd like to say it as no public property, including all public property funded by taxpayers of the city of Northampton, nor any private property located in the city of Northampton shall be exempt from the stormwater and flood control utility fee charges. Is there a second on that amendment? I'll second it. Okay. For purposes of discussion, you want to discuss the I do. Uh, Councilor. One of the arguments is, is a fee and not a tax is that everybody contribute. So in that way, um, although it is the taxpayers either way, that's an important distinction. I don't support the amendment. Thank you. I'm sorry, I just didn't understand. Could you explain again why you, why you don't support? You don't one, of the understand. One, one of the important reasons why this is a fee and not a tax is that all properties pay. And although your point is absolutely true, that either way, the citizens of Northampton will pay for this thing. One of the important things that we, we've stressed is that this is a fee and not a tax. And one of the reasons why it is, is because everyone pays private, public, federal, state, nonprofits, everyone. And I think it undercuts that argument and maybe exposes us to a legal challenge. And I don't support the amendment. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> does the solicitor have an opinion on that? I mean, you'd have to do it at the podium, but. I frankly could not hear what, what Councilor Adams said. Do you, you want to repeat, repeat your assertion? I think that one of the arguments that this is a, a one of the arguments, this is, this is a, a fee and not a tax, mm -hmm. is that everyone pays, all categories. And now we're creating an exception, and that concerns me. And that's the reason, part of the reason why. I, I didn't understand. May I, may I explain? May I clarify, please? Sure, please. please. All I want to do is be redundant in this sentence. I want to underscore the fact that everyone pays. And so maybe I'm not clear enough by saying, by, while, I, while I'm doing is actually modifying the term public property such that it stresses that it includes all public property funded presently by taxpayers of the city of Northampton, which means. You're not. Yeah, I'm not exempting, exemption. not asking yeah. for an exemption. Um, I agree with the, with, with the premise here because it's, this is the way it's been presented at all of the public meetings. And um, I just wanted to underscore the fact that taxpayers will be paying on their own property in addition to bearing the burden of being the you know, the, the financiers, the funders of the pu public property in the city of Northampton. So you, uh, you, so you just want, okay, then I'm wrong. You just want to clarify it further. Yes. Oh, yeah, I yeah. just, I'm, I'm wanting to be more redundant yes. than we already are in stressing that taxpayers pay not only once, but they pay twice. Twice. 
I'm glad I cleared I clear that up for you. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate your time. Yeah. Yeah. It was underhanded pitch, and we broadcast it. Uh, any other comments on this on the amendment? On your proposed amendment change. Uh, Mayor, would you call the roll on the amendment once you get get set? Four mayors from she's that office in the police department. So, <laughs> <laughs> can we pass an ordinance that Mary can't leave? We'll work on that next. It'll be under new business. You think that's legal? <laughs> we could ask the solicitor if that's legal. This is the Carney Amendment. <laughs> we can try. We're, we're we're pretty well through this, so. Uh, yes. 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 Okay. Where the hell are we? Uh, <laughs> 28010. I think I think I think they're picking me up now and I'll 28010. 28010 but that was uh A, wasn't it? Yes. 28010. I don't I think I was eight. I don't think we've come to, I just think we're starting 28010. 28010, 20 20 10 you're beginning. Yeah, just beginning it. A. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is 28010, stormwater and flood control utility fee credits. A. A stormwater management and flood control utility credit policy shall be developed by July 1st on 2014, maintained and from time to time amended by the Department of Public Works and approved by the Board of Public Works. The stormwater management and flood control utility credit policy will define potential credits or adjustments such as for stormwater improvements, undeveloped land with protected status, multiple undeveloped parcels under single ownership, seniors, low income, educational programs, and others. The stormwater management and flood control utility credit policy shall be available for inspection by the public at the Department of Public Works and upon the city website. Any questions on this issue? B. The Department of Public Works is hereby authorized to grant credits to property owners to be applied against stormwater and flood control utility fee based on the technical and procedural criteria set forth in the stormwater management and flood control utility credit policy. C. Any credit allowed against stormwater and flood control utility fee charge shall be conditioned on continuing compliance with the city's design and performance standards as stated in the stormwater management and flood control utility credit policy and or upon continuing provision of the controls, systems, facilities, services, and activities provided, operated, and maintained by the property owner or owners upon which credit is based. The Department of Public Works may revoke a credit at any time for non-compliance with applicable standards and criteria as established. Guess where? In the stormwater <laughs> management <laughs> control <laughs> utility credit policy of this article. D, in order to obtain a credit, the property owner must make an application to the city on forms provided by the Department of Public Works for such purposes. The application to be fully completed in accordance with the procedures outlined in the stormwater management and flood control utility policy. We have to reduce that to an acronym. I've been trying for <laughs> so, SMFCUCP. Uh, <laughs> when, when an application for credit is deemed complete by the Department of Public Works, the Director of Public Works shall have 30 days from the date the complete application is accepted to either grant the credit in whole, grant the credit in part, or deny the credit. Credits applied for by the property owner and granted in the whole or in part shall apply to all stormwater and flood control utility fee charges in accordance with the terms defined, you got it, in the <laughs> stormwater management and flood control utility credit policy. F, the stormwater management and flood control utility fee credit policy as developed, maintained, and from time to time amended by the Department of Public Works and approved by the Board of Public Works and may be amended at any time by the City Council. Mm -hmm. yes. Hit it. <laughs> I'm just curious about a number of things with regard to the credit policy. Um, one being someone applies for a credit because they have stormwater barrels. Let's just say hypothetically that's one of the possible credits. Um, will there be any kind of ongoing um, inspection that those continue to be in use? 
um, one of the one of the things that was brought up by somebody in a condo um, situation is that they had they built the condo so that there are actual um, there's a French drain but then the French drain was clogged I mean how how will the inspection of this happen and then the other question I have is will there be any kind of retrospective credit so if someone doesn't get there for a year to file their application um, will they get retrospective credit uh, retroactive credit retro retroactive thank you thank you um, it's late <coughs> uh, Jim or uh, Alan did you have you want to comment on this or to this 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 is another thing that didn't jump out at me, but um, we are now um, authorizing the city council to modify a policy established by a, a department of the executive branch. <coughs> mm -hmm. What? Which we can't. The Department of Public Works is part of the executive branch, and um, this provision calls for the city council to amend, without any role of the mayor. Um, in overseeing the policies established by a department of the executive branch of government. And this is. I'm, I'm talking about the last phrase. The last phrase in, where the on F. F. And may be amended at any time by the city council. The, can't the, the, can't this, the city council create ordinances that mandate the department of public works to do certain things? And, and if so, how is this any different? Exactly. Well, it could be amended by ordinance passed by the mayor, but this doesn't say by an ordinance. It just says that the city council can modify the policy established by the by the Department and Board of Public Works. So, are you, are you suggesting just changing that language to add by ordinance? Is that is that what you're saying? That well, we, we need to modify by the language. Ordinance. Uh, that's one way of doing. It, or. Um, by the mayor with the approval of the city council. Okay. So, so you're I don't think that the, the city council has autonomous authority over a department of the uh, executive branch, just as the, the city council couldn't go in and modify the policies of any other department right. um, because yes. they're under the auspices right. of the mayor, they're the executive branch. If you say by ordinance, you also exclude the opportunity for the mayor. So could you go ahead. Well, uh, how about? Um, the, the, the stormwater management and flood control utility fee credit policy has developed, um, well, just even more simple, the stormwater management and flood control utility fee credit policy can be amended by um, city by ordinance of the city council. Um, yes. Why would just be ordinance? Um, just by ordinance. Ordinance, sorry, that's redundant. Okay, ordinance. Yeah. Yeah. Ordinance. Yeah. I mean, as long as the mayor has the, you, his... Are, are you more concerned with the absence of the mayor in this language? I am. I like it. And, and if that were included, if the mayor were included in this description, would you be more comfortable with that? Um, I w yes, I think that we need the, the, uh, the action of both the mayor and the city council to do that. By well, actually, by I think mayor the mayor could do that. Or by ordinance. Um, he could do it without us. He can do it without an ordinance, by the mayor or by ordinance. By the, by the mayor or by ordinance. I don't have a problem with that. We're actually talking about amending the language um, based well, on the recommendation a, from the solicitor. Well, so I would like to actually hear somebody actually describe I'll, the I'll move that we amend that, unless uh, you want, I'll move that we amend that last line to say, may be amended by the mayor or by ordinance. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Now for discussion. Okay with that? You got that, Mary? <laughs> Carney too. <laughs> Those carnies. <laughs> what I say? Uh, roll call, please. Yes. 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 Okay, and and then Jim, you were going to come up and speak to. Uh, I'd like to. Come. Yeah, and you, uh, the the enforcement question that was uh, laid out by Councillor Klein. Sure. Uh, good question by Councillor Klein. Um, 
depending on the type of credit that people apply for, there are requirements that um, submission of proof that um, the type of stormwater management structure that the credit has been issued for is functioning in accordance with its design. Um, that applies. There's a variety of credits in the draft credit policy manual that's been distributed. There's a couple of credits in particular that that would apply to. Um, the small residential stormwater improvements credit would be one such credit where um, renewal applications include um, this would include the need to submit proof that the approved structures are functioning in good working condition, et cetera. And um, there's also another type of credit that would, re would also require um, the submittal of proof um, that the systems are functioning as designed. Can I just ask another kind of follow-up question? What about an appeals uh, appeal process? Is that is there any discussion about that kind of? Uh, yeah, language? I think there there is an appeals process within the ordinance itself, which would refer um, the first level of appeal would go to to, to the director of public works or conversation with the department the department director. Specifically about credits, though. Would follow the same. Um, mm -hmm. It would follow the same aspect of the ordinance, so it would go to the Direct Public Works for discussion and resolution. If uh, satisfaction wasn't achieved um, through that process, it would be referred to the full Board of Public Works for consideration, so uh, as drafted in the ordinance. And, and you'll see that repeated when we come up to the next section on delinquencies as well. Uh, Council Spector, did you have a question? Okay. 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 Council LaBarge. Thank you. Um, Jim, I have several subdivisions on my ward and a lot of them are fully responsible of maintaining and taking care in the maintenance part of, of the streets and also the sewer, what we're talking about on the utility fee. To me, I mean, they would be credited, right? Because if they're maintaining it, they're spending all this money, it would be like double dipping them. Here they're paying to take care of it. And then we're putting a fee. Would they be credited? They would be eligible to apply for credits. Um, this was certainly something that was discussed um, in great detail by the task force, and something that they felt um, would be worthy of um, being fo uh, being able to apply for a credit for those types of systems. So, we would anticipate seeing credit applications from some of the subdivisions in your ward. Thank you, Councilor Klein. I think there's a lot. There are a lot of um, kind of uh, soft possibilities for credits that um, I, I'm actually wondering if there's a way in which we can encourage residents of Northampton to um, use organic lawn care because there's some evidence that if you in fact take care of your lawn without fertilizers and things like that it actually will absorb water much more efficiently and things like that but I'm just wondering you know we say from time to time it's going to be the um, the credit manual whatever it's called is going to be revised but I'm wondering if um, more evidence comes to light, more research is done, and it shows that, for instance, that kind of lawn care is really going to cut down or uh, create a, more of an absorption capacity or something like that, if that can be um, that can be a credit. Just if there's a way in which maybe we can say um, annually it will be revised or, and so I'm saying two different things. If annually it can be revised, but also if there's some way in which we can actually use this to encourage um, residents to think about um, things like organic lawn care and other, other ways of handling. Sure, runoff. absolutely. We, we would be very interested in um, looking at amendments like that to the policy. Um, I'm actually pretty proud of the policy as it stands right now. It's a fairly comprehensive policy. If you compare the policy that's been drafted to policies in other communities, we have a wide variety of, um, of credit uh, types that are available for people. Some of the ideas came from the task force. Some ideas were from staff at Public Works. Um, and I think we're looking at trying to implement what we have here. We could uh, look at any time uh, at revising the policy to add things. And um, I'll say that up front, um, with a new enterprise fund getting a new um, type of utility, um, in, in action, I guess, in implementing it, if this ordinance is approved, there'll be a lot of work basically to get things moving forward in the right direction. So a whole new enterprise, a lot of things to be done. There's a fair amount of work that would need to be done under the, under the policy manual. So we're trying to be cognizant of, of how much we can achieve um, in the first year or so in terms of just trying to get the enterprise off on the right foot, the change of operations, the variety of new things that need to be done. Uh, while also implementing the policy. The policy manual um, 
reaches far because it, it goes to residential property owners as well as commercial. And there was some discussion about um, some communities only offer credits for commercial property. They don't go to the residential level. And we felt for educational purposes um, and having more buy-in from people within the community made a lot of sense to have uh, the residential sector available either to get uh, credits or incentives. And those were incorporated in, um, in the draft policy manual. So um, I think the points that you make are good. Um, we try to be as up to date as we can on, on technical developments within the field. And we, the, the things that you point out are certainly worth watching. So is it already written, the manual? There's a draft manual that was distributed. We have it. We have it. We have it. And there yeah, right here. And there will be and the final entry to July 1st, uh, so. final revised. So if you actually have some recommendations, because we don't mm -hmm. actually codify it here, it's it just has this wonderful stormwater management and flood control utility fee credit policy manual, which will be available. It, not in, in its its enforceable stage, but not its final stage. There is no final stage. It's a, a, a virtual living document that will be amended as circumstances allow, and as you guys are uh, kept a pace of, of technology that uh, at, at for offsets. Council Labarge, do you have a question? Okay. And, and Councilor Klein, are you? Um, I'm just wondering if it doesn't make sense for us to um, <clears throat> actually set a, some kind of time frame for um, the review, the ongoing review. You, uh, Councilor Spector? I actually think um, my understanding is that the review is going to be ongoing. And exactly. therefore, instead of saying, well, they'll do it every year, I would hope, especially in the early phase, there's a lot of things as you're saying there may be some credits coming up or other things that it won't be even the year it'll be as it comes up say wow we didn't even think of that and we'll put it in there and it will only be three weeks down the road so I'd rather do it that way than say wait a whole year but rather say no as these new credits they at any time they might add credits to mm -hmm. this Councilor O'Donnell I'd also note that um, in ordinance we put on that small section about requiring annual reports Yes, you did. So that might be a good time for the council to engage with the Board of Public Works and ask, you know, how, how is the credit policy these days? You know? Yeah, no, I think, it, I think that would be a great thing, a great time to do it. And it, it meets the need of annually reporting on the effectiveness of the policy and the need to add things. Um, of course, we're always open to ideas if councilors have them to let us know about um, suggestions about the policy anyway. And, and there's also the joint committee that a number of counselors sit on and so if other counselors have heard things we can also there is a formal process where we can have a dialogue about that as well. and access to this policy will be through the website as well so the public has an opportunity to review and if they have recommendations they can forward to the counselors or to the DPW and um, they would be considered so just one minor right. thing could the app are, are the applications <coughs> So they don't even have to come in, but they can get the application, download it, fill it out, and then bring it in. They can. Yep. Okay. Oh. All right. Any more questions, uh, Councilor Labarge? Um, <coughs> do you have some residents who don't have computers? Is there any way that they could just come into the Board of Public Works and pick up one of the packages? Absolutely. Okay. Sure. Thank you. <coughs> All right. We're going to move on to uh, Section Two Eighty Eleven. Stormwater and flood control utility fee billing, delinquencies, collections, abatements. Almost done. <clears throat> a. Failure of the city to send a bill for stormwater and flood control utility shall not relieve the property owner of record from the obligation to pay for such utility. If a property is unbilled or if no bill is sent for a particular parcel of land, the city may back bill for the fees as applicable for a period not to exceed one year of charges. But no lay fees and no delinquency charges of any kind shall be charged or recovered from any property owner so back billed. <coughs> Excuse me. B. Stormwater and flood control utility bills shall be managed by the Department of Public Works for collection. The Northampton tax collector shall keep the records of all paid and unpaid stormwater utility bills and maintain financial records for the utility. C. If a bill for stormwater and flood control utility bill is not paid in full by the 30th day from the date the bill is mailed, interest at a rate of 14% per annum shall accrue on any unpaid balance. 
interest shall accrue from the date of the mailing of the bill. D. Any time after interest begins to accrue on an unpaid account, the Northampton tax collector may serve on the party assessed a statement of the amount due, including interest with a demand for payment. A charge is set forth in Chapter 174. Fees shall be made for such a demand. If the amount due remains unpaid for 14 days after the mailing of said demand, the Northampton tax collector shall commit the amount of the board uh, to the Board of Assessors for inclusion on the next annual property tax bill. Upon inclusion of the unpaid amount on an annual property tax bill, the amount due shall be a lien on the property and which shall have a priority over all other liens except municipal liens and mortgages of record prior to the recording of the notice of a lien. E. In the event that a property owner believes the stormwater and flood control utility fee is improperly calculated or is otherwise incorrect, the property owner may, within 30 days from the date of issuance of the stormwater and flood control utility bill and after payment of the bill in full, apply to the Department of Public Works for an abatement. And the application for abatement shall be supported by such information as is necessary for a reasonable person to conclude that it is more likely than not that the billing is an error. The Department of Public Works shall have 60 days to consider the request for abatement and render a written decision which may deny the abatement grant the abatement in full or grant the abatement in part. 280.12. Sounds good, doesn't it? Okay. A. Is, is there a B? Yeah, there is a B. Okay. <laughs> uh, a. In the, in the event that a property owner is aggrieved by a written decision from the Department of Public Works denying an application for abatement in whole or in part or denying any application for a credit, in whole or in part, the property owner shall have 30 days from the date of the written decision to file an appeal to the Board of Public Works. The appeal shall be written, no, the shall be in writing, and shall specify the grounds thereof. On the filing of the notice of appeal with the Department of Public Works, the Department shall forthwith transmit to the Board of Public Works all documents constituting the record upon which the particular decision was made. The Board of Public Works shall set a date of hearing which shall be within 90 days of the date of the filing of the appeal and notice there, uh, thereof setting the forth the place, date, and time of the hearing uh, shall be sent to the property owner no less than 10 days prior to the hearing date. And the Board of Public Works shall render a written decision within 10 days of the conclusion of the hearing, <coughs> affirming the action of the department or reversing the action. If reversing the denial of abatement, the decision shall specify the sum to be abated, which shall not exceed the amounts paid. If reversing the denial of a credit, the decision shall specify the credit to be applied prospectively against any future charges unless the property owner has paid the full amount of the stormwater and flood control utility fee as charged and also requested as an abatement. All right, B. In the event that a property owner fails to pay the stormwater and flood control utility fee as charged and the city utilizes the process set forth in section 16A through 16F of chapter 83 of the general laws to collect and unpaid charges, the property owner shall have the right to seek an abatement by filing an application for abatement with the Board of Public Works in accordance with the remedy specified in section 16E of chapter 83 of uh, the said law, uh, general laws with a copy delivered to the Board of Assessors. The application for abatement shall conform to the requirements for notice of appeal as set forth in subsection A above. And the process for hearing before the Board of Public Works, including the applicable time limits, shall be set forth therein. In the event that the Board of Public Works denies the abatement, in whole or in part, it shall, in its written decision, include a statement notifying the property owner of the right to seek a review of the decision by filing an appeal with the Appellate Tax Board of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts within three months of the date of the decision of the Board of Public Works. As the right of Appellate Tax Board review under this subsection B is derived from applicable sections of the general laws as contained in chapters 59 and 83 thereof, to the extent that the terms of this ordinance <coughs> conflict with terms specified therein, the terms specified in the general laws control. 2830, uh, 2813, public reports. The Board of Public Works shall make an annual presentation of the City Council providing the information relating to the work and the projects financed by the Stormwater and Flood Control Utility in the previous year, including to the extent practicable 
an account of expenditures from the stormwater management and flood control account and projected future expenditures. The board will also present this information in a written report accessible on the city website. City Solicitor. May I direct your attention to uh, the very beginning of the ordinance where it says amends section 280-1 through 280-12. There are 13 sections. That should be 280-13. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, and I will give credit to the finance director for that before she left. Okay. Before she ran bolting out the door. <laughs> so uh, thank you uh, to Susan Wright. And that will also be a Scrivener's adjustment. So, um, you get a Council Murphy. And I just want to say that we added 13 in ordinance, so it wasn't in the original version, which is there was only 12 in the original version, which is how that just got anomaly accept. occurred. I understand. Um, thank you for accepting that blame and falling on your sword for that. <laughs> we appreciate that. <laughs> Councilors, that's the document. Uh, is there are there any general or larger questions to that document because they're going to call for a vote soon so any other discussion I'd like to just say thank you all good work and thank you all really good work um, uh, this process has been I think a paragon uh, for uh, for the community because as as Council Spector pointed out I think this, this actually, well, arguably this has been going, ongoing for 20 years, it's certainly the, the need for this, but we got it done. And we got it done in the right and clear fashion. And we crafted law in the best way, utilizing the best practices. That's a pat on our own back, but the fact is is that we, most of the heavy lifting was done by people sitting out there as opposed to us. Uh, and I appreciate the citizen engagement too on this point. The citizen engagement actually was unparalleled. I haven't seen any, the level of involvement that we've seen on this, on any other ordinance that I've ever, <coughs> in the, whatever it is, 14 years that I've been associated with the council. I'm proud of that too, because I think that um, too often a lot of responsibility is put on the council when point in fact, actually we are just amplifiers for the public. And we need public input in order to create amplification. So, um, uh, Mary, would you call the question for the amended language presented that was that was advanced and put on the floor by Council Murphy, that reflects the changes made by the city solicitor and the amendments approved uh, during the course of this debate? Council Chair, yes. 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 It passes in the first reading. The sausage is not quite. We haven't tied off the casing, but the, uh, uh, this will be uh, voted on again in two weeks' time. Thank you all very much. Um, by the way. Uh, I have no other further announcements. We're at the end of our meeting, and I will accept the motion. To motion adjourn. to adjourn. Second it. All those in favor of adjournment, please say aye. Aye. aye.